Are the snipers ready? Okay, I guess we're live. We are live. All right. Great. Okay, well, here we go. The very first official live stream on this channel. And uh, hello to everybody, all of our friends out there. Hello to the troll army, um, to the mentally obsessed compulsive disorder people, psychos. I'm sure you're watching as well. You couldn't help but not watch. Um, the way we're going to do this is we're going to watch the video and comment on it. Uh, myself, Brother Jeremy, and Brother Tim. And, of course, you can have all the conversation in the chat area. Um, but then at the end, we'll have um, question and answer. So if you're a troll and a smart one, which I know you're not, most trolls are not smart. But uh, if you are, you'll just kind of <laughs> keep your you know, comments hidden until the end because we're pretty much not going to be caring about your comments while we're going through the video. Um, and of course we have a lot of moderators here to patrol things. Um, and, and, and I will say this towards the end, if you are somebody that disagrees, you're would call yourself an enemy of this ministry or whatever. Um, you know, if you ask a respectful question, we will answer it, but it has to be respectful. Don't be a jerk about it. Of course, no profanity and things like that. We're saved, you know, say people don't use profanity. All right. So as a regular, you know, part of their language. So without further ado, let's see if we can get this thing started. It's my first time doing this, so bear with me. Uh, I think it should work. Yeah, there you go. And. Whoa. Okay, so which one am I? You're okay, good. So wanna... You're presenting. Yeah, right now. All you got to do is go to the video. Yeah, just minimize your hangout thing and then uh, go to the video. That's all you got to do. Do I put it over here on this one? Yeah, there you go. That's it. That's it. Okay. Let me just see if I can do something here quick. Um, okay, because it's, it's still showing up. Yep. Looking, looking all right here. Okay, yeah, you are. All right, here, let's get this thing started. And I'll apologize in advance for the mind control cues and things that they use throughout this. Um, I really do believe that Paul Wittenberger is behind this video um, because he uses a lot of the Hollywood mind control sound effects and things, which we'll talk about. And we will be skipping certain parts, and I'll explain why as we continue. Which we'll talk about, and we will be skipping. Uh, uh, Brian, it doesn't have audio. Huh? There's no audio coming out of it. There's no audio? No. wonder why. That's kind of odd. Oh, I think it's because you have headphones in. <laughs> you can't win for losing, can you? <laughs> the church has teamed up with Verity Baptist Church in Sacramento, California to expose this heresy but also to educate Christians regarding this dangerous doctrine that has permeated many churches. Feel free to share this video with family and friends. Subscribe to the channel for future films. God bless and hope you enjoy. Okay, um, real quick here. <clears throat> you know, if, if you see anything you want me to stop, just make sure you say, hold your hand up and say stop. But I'll just... I just got to say a little comment here on Hebrews 13, verse 8. They'll do this. They'll say, Jesus Christ the same yesterday and today and forever. And they say, well, then see, salvation's always been the same. The gospel's always been the same. You know, the charismatics do the same thing. So mm -hmm. continue. Adam a fan and that's now a hypocrite and a terrible heretic and everything and been kicked out of the church. 
<laughs> but it, these guys are such a cult, you know. I mean, they can't even hold on to people for more than a year or so. If they just, you know, all of a sudden the guy disagrees and then everybody comes out and attacks him. Kind of funny. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> We need to reject the fight against the demolish dispensation. <laughs> Impressive. <laughs> uh, pretty graphic. Yeah. <laughs> what is dispensational? Amen. The part of the chapter we're going to focus on is found in Second Peter chapter three, verse fourteen. For the Bible reads, "Wherefore, beloved, seeing that you look for such things, be diligent that ye may be found of him in peace, without spot and blameless." An account that the long suffering of our Lord is salvation, even as our beloved brother Paul, also according to the wisdom given unto him, hath written unto you, as also in all his epistles, speaking in them of these things, in which are some things hard to be understood, which they that are unlearned and unstable rest. Yeah. It's kind of the base level. What is dispensation? Oh, sorry. I was looking at No, it's fine. <laughs> <laughs> no, I just noticed that. Uh, that thing behind uh, that that guy that said, you know, you're a chosen generation. Well, if you actually read the passage there, it's talking about the Jews. Yeah. You know, it goes on to say you're a holy nation, a royal priesthood. It's not talking about believers. You know, I just want to make that point. Mm -hmm. But then yeah. again, you know, they're replacement theology. So what do you expect? Mm -hmm. Yeah, they are the Jews. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> whatever. <laughs> you're going to see all throughout this movie or video, whatever you want to call it. Um, you're going to see all throughout that they're cutting their own throat. It's kind of funny. You know, they're actually condemning themselves with the scriptures that they're trying to use against us. So, but anyways, let's, you ready to continue? Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. Okay. Where did dispensational theology come from? This view that we're calling dispensational pre-tribulational premillennialism um, has been the dominant perspective in American evangelicalism for about the last 115 to 20 years. Okay, pause it. Okay. I just want to comment on that. Premillennialism, how he just said, it's the dominant view. Okay, explain to me how else you could look at the Bible, because the Bible is premillennial all the way. I mean, even these post-tribbers understand there's some that Jesus is going to set up his kingdom on this earth. And yet this guy just said, you know, the view, quote unquote, the Bible gives no room for any other view. You can't be omnimillennial or postmillennial. They both do not work at all. So I just want to point that out because it just makes it sound like as if it's something fallible when it, our book that's infallible points out clearly that it's always been premillennial. Yeah. Yep. Well, they like to, are they like trying to say that they're not premillennialists now? Are they preterists or something? You know? no, they'll probably eventually go to amillennial. Mm -hmm. Right. Position. But it's funny, too, because they show this big, huge Babel building, you know, and all these guys in these robes and things. That's not Bible believing Christianity. No. So what those guys, what those heretics believe, these, you know, Baptists, uh, we're not part of that anyways. So whatever. All right, let's continue. And you will not find the idea that we are going to escape the Antichrist until approximately 140 years ago when a 15 year old girl had a revelation and that revelation was picked up by J.M. Darby founder of the Plymouth Brethren and developed into a form of theology known as dispensational theology 
Okay. Uh, Got to pause that. When anybody brings up the John Nelson Darby argument, they've lost already. Okay. Because number one, there's plenty of things before John Nelson Darby. Plenty of people were writing about it. Early church fathers wrote some things about the church being taken out before the time of great tribulation or the time, the end time thing or whatever. There are, there are, there's pr- proof of that. And the, the even more important thing to get is they say, well, no Christians believed in the pre-trib rapture before 1830. Oh, really? Um, who are you calling Christians? See, mm-hmm. they're calling the Catholic church. That's who they're referring to. The yeah. Catholic church has always been amillennial and, the church is going to go through the final time of purification and all that stuff. So as soon as they bring up the 1830 argument, you're not dealing with a Bible believing Christian because Bible believing Christians deal with scripture. I can care less who came up with what or who said what or whatever else. What does the Bible say? You know, and they bring that up. You know that you're dealing with a Catholic. Yep. Just as simple as that. I mean, bring this down here real quick like that. Um, bring here over just to show you a little funny fun proof here just go to google and type in dispensationalism okay go to wikipedia right here check this out there's no mention of dispensationalism before 1830 you get down here uh okay history the concept of the arranging of divisions of biblical history dates back to Irenaeus during the second century Mm -hmm. um yes they were rightly dividing and and doing dispensational types of things they call it different economies or whatever else but yeah some of these early church fathers were talking about different dispensations so you're going to hear it all throughout this film this lie they'll say oh there was no mention of it before 1830 they're liars yep yep people talked about the preacher rapture before 1830 They talked about dispensationalism before 1830, you know, right. Just stupid. And to other, to further that point even more, I watched that debate between uh, Joe Schimmel and uh, what's his name. Oh, Uh, I can't remember. Doug Stauffer. Yeah. And it's funny because Joe Schimmel uses the exact same language that these guys are using. You know, he'll go back and quote the Catholics and all that stuff and say, you know, see, they they condemned it, you know, and all that stuff, you know, and whatever. Which 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 church are you talking about again? You know, I, I see this a lot with post trippers. I seen it back in the street preaching days. You know, mm-hmm. so you can keep going. Yep. All right, we'll continue. Then Mr. Darby took um, took his gospel of the rapture to the United States, and he came in contact with the Billy Graham of his day. His name was Dwight L. Moody founder of the Moody Bible Institute and Moody Press and all of that. Moody became the sort of worldwide disseminator of his theology of dispensationalism. Uh, yeah, because he was saved, you know. See, see, I'm convinced that this, this Anderson cult is going to go after every real man of God that's ever been, you know, because they're Catholic. Catholics, if you learn anything about church history, Catholics are very bitter about anybody that goes against their system. You know, that's why they dug up Oliver Cromwell's body and publicly beheaded his, his dead body. And then they took his head, his decapitated head and stuck it on the, on the top of some big Catholic cathedral in England. And it was there for, I think it was over a hundred years or something like that. You know, they're sick, disgusting people. Catholics are very bitter about any Bible believing Christian that goes against the system. Mm-hmm. You know, so they'll, they'll come back. They'll attack. And that's you'll see. They're attacking Ruckman. They, they're attacking D. L. Moody. You know, just sickening. Pre tribulation rapture on both sides of the Atlantic, and for a very long time. And then we were off and running. Dispensationalism is a is essentially is a method of interpretation of understanding the Bible which translates the Bible literally in its historic and uh, poetic and wisdom literature, all of it, and reads it at at face value, interpretively, and understands Israel to be taking priority in God's program and and then gets to the church and the church is separate. I want to say this. Dispensationalism is a man-made structure 
for understanding the Bible. <laughs> Shut your stupid mouth, Lawson. Go back to endorsing Billy Graham. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, Lawson put out puts out a lot of good stuff, but I don't trust the man. I mean, you get no. some some government goon, FEMA goon, standing up in your pulpit and endorsing Billy Graham and saying send money to him, and coming out and saying Constantine was a saved man and and you know did great things and promoting Donald Trump. That nah, that nah, sorry, I don't trust you. Just as simple as that. But saying it's a man-made system. Give me a break. Mm -hmm. Stupid. And of course, these you know Anderson goons will latch on to that. Yeah. But, all right. Continue. It needs to be understood right off the bat. It's man-made. God worked with people in different times. There were dispensations of periods of times in which God worked with a certain people in a certain way. God has given certain programs through uh, biblical history and the history of man and that he is operating in certain ways in revealing his sovereign way and rule. And until you see that, you can never truly understand the Bible. You're studying a timeline. You're saying this truth fits here. This, this truth, these events fit there. I've seen other people say there's nine or there's 11 dispensations. You can make as many different dispensations as you want. <laughs> principally, there's, there's seven uh, economies of time before the fall, after the fall, et cetera, et cetera. And Schofield in his notes even hinted that there were different ways of salvation from Old Testament and New Testament. You get to the dispensation of grace in the church, yeah, for instance. Well, that would assume, in that case, that grace didn't exist prior. So now God has turned his attention to the Gentiles, and we in the church are part of this air, uh, this dispensation of grace, but God still has to keep those promises that he made to Israel. Dispensationalism, by the way, is simply a title for theology that recognizes a literal nation Israel to be restored in the future. God gave them that land. They owned that land compelled to be a dispensationalist and uh, the reason for that is because all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable but all scripture does not apply to the same people at the same time and this is the key to understanding New Testament remember I told you that there's a key like the keystone I mentioned over the window you get the key and the key will help you because everything relates to that key in one fashion or another and it's what opens up the New Testament, and I told you what the key was to the New Testament, is the Jew. Get the, it's like Lord of the Rings music or something going on in the background here. Yeah, really. Drama. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I make video, okay? I understand the use of sound effects and the use of music and things and whatever else. I mean, come on. You don't need to make it this dramatic and it. Dun, dun, dun. Yeah, really. Whatever. <laughs> oh, boy. Here we go again. More dramatic Welcome nonsense. Pastor of Verity Baptist Church in Sacramento, California. Our church is non dispensational. And I am excited uh, to be able to be part of a documentary that is going to expose the heresies of dispensation. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a Baptist. Uh, this guy looks like a Muslim. Yeah. <laughs> I said that last night. Dispensationalism is an interpretive system that was created in the 1830s by John Nelson. And the of <laughs> no, it wasn't there. Akbar, <laughs> you know, <laughs> created in 1830 by John Nelson Darby. No, stupid, it wasn't. <laughs> you know, <laughs> come on. <laughs> you know, do a do a little Google search there, honey. I mean, come on. Yeah. <laughs> Give me a break. Uh, just go back to sleep with my pandas. <laughs> 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 All right. All right. Is to the Bible, all of his teachings on salvation, 
into seven different time periods or what they would refer to as dispensations. And it basically allows them to cut up the Bible so that they can put certain scriptures into certain that either don't apply to us today. Second Timothy 2.15 says, study to show that self-proven to God is working in the need not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. And they claim that Second Timothy 2.15 is an instruction to basically isolate the Bible into seven different time periods and modify salvation based upon those dispensations. This time period here, I'm going to dispense my grace this way. This time period here, I'm going to dispense it this way. Now we're going to see that God has dispensed different methods of salvation. You see, the instruction there is not to partition uh -huh. the Bible into seven different time periods, but rather to compare Scripture with Scripture. This is the Bible's interpretive system to guarantee his biblical knowledge and safeguard it. Yeah. <laughs> scripture with scripture. Okay. Then enter this for me. I just got to do this one time. Okay. And it, it just, it'll make me feel better. Uh, Ezekiel chapter three, verse 20. Hold All on. Right. I'll get that up. All right. Let me know when you're there. Oh. Did you say Ezekiel chapter 3 verse 20? 3 verse 20. Yeah. Uh, and it says, again, when a righteous man do turn from his righteousness and commit iniquity, and I lay a stumbling block before him, he shall die, because thou hast not given him warning. He shall die in his sin. A righteous man, we're talking about here, and his righteousness which he had done shall not be remembered, but his blood will require thine hand. Uh, this is talking about dying in your sins. What did Jesus Christ say? Ye shall die in your sins if you believe not that I am he. What does it mean to die in your sins? It means you'll die and go to hell. A righteous man. Now, how does that line up with what Paul wrote? You know? Yep. Absolutely. Better yeah. yet. <clears throat> I mean, oh, go ahead. Sorry. No, go ahead. No, no, go ahead. I'm done. I was just going to say better yet. I don't want to get too ahead, ahead of ourselves, but later on they're going to talk about how David talked to, uh, basically spoke about, you know, uh, uh, sin not being imputed to uh, the man, so on and so forth and all that. And they'll try to use that to say that David was saved by grace through faith the same way we are today. Fact the matter is, that's not what it's talking about. David was a type and so was Abraham. There were types of what a Christian is now with being sealed by the Holy Spirit of promise because in Psalm 51 verse 11, um, cast me not away from thy presence <clears throat> and take not thy Holy Spirit from me. So if David was saved the same way we are today, why is he asking God not to take the Holy Spirit from him? I mean, there's, you know, it's very important things that they just ignore about scripture. Yeah, absolutely. So, okay, we'll continue with Funville here. Yeah. There's some seducing spirits in doctrines of devil. They believe dispensationalism means that, that basically God uh, took time and, and separated in different segments on how people got saved. Dispensationalism's method of interpreting the Bible does not stem from God because the Bible tells us that God is a God of order. He is not the author of confusion. Whereas dispensationalists have this ambiguous approach to the Bible where the interpretation is subject to the teacher teaching it and how many dispensations they believe in. And they'll say only sections of the Bible apply to us today and other sections apply to other dispensations. You see, the Bible is the Bible. Old Testament, New Testament. There's the end. So you may think like, well, what's the big deal that people think that God worked with man at different times and different ages? And here's what you need to understand. Dispensationalism is literally the backbone that props us most of the heresy that is taught today by fundamentalist Christians, by conservative Christians. For example, throughout the scriptures, we see the salvation has always been the same. David is saved by God. <laughs> okay. <laughs> the answer is Ezekiel 3.20 there, princess. Hey, without the deeds of the law. But what does dispensationalism do? It seeks to change that. So when you ask the question, is dispensationalism... Pause it, pause it. Pause it. <laughs> that floor. That checkerboard floor behind him. He's a mason. Yeah. They love to make up conspiracy theories about dispensationalism. Look at that Masonic stuff behind him. Yeah, really. <laughs> Good point. You know? But, you know, and, and you know, again, I got to say this about Paul Wittenberger. Um, I did a video about him years ago. 
and uh, I brought out this thing of this art that the guy was painting. And I mean, he just sick, twisted art, just modern art looking stuff, you know, and uh, and he had a whole gallery of it. And I came out and I mentioned I was going to make a video about it. He deleted the whole stinking thing. And I was only able to find some of his paintings and things. But the guy was the guy is sick. I mean, he works with Hollywood. As, I mean, yeah. this past year, 2018, he's still working with Hollywood. Yeah, yes. And guess what show he's uh, um, producing? Hell's Kitchen. Yeah. Right now, currently. I'm not joking. Yeah, absolutely. You can go to his IMDb page and um, on the internet, you can see it all. Yep. And uh, he, he was also involved the same time he was making uh, after the tribulation, he was involved with um, the Knights Templar or something like that. You know? So, yeah, these guys are Satanists. He has tie kind of matches the floor too there. It's kind of Yeah. Yeah, you yeah. could be Jason. You never know. I mean, again, they'll they'll say, well, Ezekiel three twenty is one verse. I can show you multiple verses where it says you can lose your salvation in the old testament. Yep. Probably at least fifteen to twenty off the top yeah. of my head. Yeah. So don't even start. Yeah. So keep going. And, and they, they're real careful not to mention the future either with the time of Jacob's trouble, you know, what if you take the mark? That you know, yeah. they don't talk much about that either. Yeah. You know, what about the verses in Hebrews? You know? Yeah. All right, let's continue. So, yes. This doctrine needs to be exposed because of the fact it promotes so many false documents. You see, those who adhere to this doctrine have completely redefined the term dispensation. Dispensation simply means a manner of rule and economy. In fact, it comes from the, uh, uh, the Greek word oikonomia, and it meant basically that glides into our English word economy an administration or an economy that which is the age of the church and just the word dispensation itself just means to disperse something <laughs> and in fact the bible tells us in first Corinthians 5 to 17, for if i do this thing willingly i have a reward but if against my will a dispensation of the gospel is committed unto me and paul said that for Corinthians. i gotta just stop for a minute this guy sounds like a sodomite big time he might work <laughs> Sounds like a girl. Word dispensation means that spires. Huh? <laughs> but you know, this what's with the unfocusing and refocusing on the scriptures? You know, show a little bit of reverence to the word of God and let the scripture be clear. You know, you don't gotta do all no. these graphic effects with it and the and the sound effects and stuff. It's it, these guys are demonic. But <laughs> yeah. And talking about him dispensing the gospel. He distributed and dispensed the responsibility to Paul to preach the gospel to every creature. And if you listen to these dispensationalists, mm -hmm. they will they will tell you that dispensationalism is the key doctrine to understanding scripture, understanding salvation. If you don't get dispensationalism, you're not going to get anything right. You must have dispensationalism. Dispensationalism. I got to say something. I gotta say something, okay? If if the if he like what he just said there, he said the dispensation was committed onto Paul, right? Okay, then explain Acts chapter two to me. Yeah. You know, repentance and baptism, water baptism going on in Acts chapter two. Right. You know, they don't answer anything from the Bible. It's just all their words. Mm -hmm. Yep. And they focus a lot on Gene Kim and Robert Breaker, who both have, you know, are fake. So, right. Let's continue. Go ahead. Yeah, I'm sorry. The foundation for that. If you don't have that, you will never find the truth in the Word of God. Here's a question I have for you. If dispensationalism is the key doctrine that is needed for the understanding of Scripture, then why was it invented 1,800 years after Christ? You know, there's a lot of people who are saved that are adhering to the doctrine of dispensationalism and their faith is being overthrown. They're believing <laughs> all kinds of heresy and false doctrine that's going to affect them in the long run. And it's because they're not rightly dividing the word of truth. They're not comparing scripture with scripture. Okay. okay. But the reason we're preaching on this is because we don't want to be thrown and tossed to and fro, carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slight of men and cunning craftiness whereby they lie in wait for the seed. You see, dispensationalists are tricky. But a soul will live forever someplace, and I wouldn't want you burning. 
I want you happy with God and Jesus Christ. That's why I preach to you. And just like any other false religion, what they do is they'll use some truth, right? Because the fact of the matter is, most dispensationalists, guess what they are? They're King James only. Our final, absolute final authority in all matters of faith and practice is the Bible, supposedly, right? So they get their supposedly. foot in the <laughs> churches under the guise okay. of King James only, but then what do they do? They bring in their leaven, and a little leaven leaven at the whole lot. Believing the King James Bible is the absolute perfect word of God is ridiculous. It is. But it's way down on a long list of ridiculous things that we believe. Second Peter chapter. Okay, totally taking the guy out of context. You know, I got my issues with Sam Gip, but give me a break. Just cutting out part of his video. These guys do this all the time. They did it with me. They've done it with you know my videos and things. They'll search any little thing, cut it out, and totally misrepresent what you're saying. Yeah. Stupid. You know. Chapter 2, verse number 1, the Bible says, But there were false prophets also among the people, even as there shall be false teachers among you, who privily shall bring in damnable heresies, even denying the Lord that bought them. You know what I never called Jesus Christ? I never called him my Messiah. So the Bible's teaching us here that... <laughs> Got a pause there for, again, give me a lot of pausing in this. Um, <laughs> you know, Jesus isn't our Messiah. We're not Jews. Yeah. Okay. That's why the word Messiah, you know, only appears, I think, once in the New Testament. You know, Messiah's there. It's, it's you know, usually it's the word Christ. Yeah. You know, give me a break. You know, our, our ancestors, you know, if you're non-Jewish, our ancestors are pagans. Okay. Mm -hmm. And we're looking forward to a, a Messiah coming. No. Yeah. So continue. But there will be false teachers even among us. And let's just go ahead and, and, and apply it to independent Baptists. There's a whole lot of dispensational false teachers out there who are independent Baptist circles. I mean, for decades, they've influenced the independent Baptists to believe these heretical teachings. The reason that that's important is because today it is the independent Baptists that have the word of God, that have the true salvation, that are the ones that are actually doing what God has called to do. You know, one of my goals in life is before I die or retire or get incarcerated or whatever's going to happen, you know, before I'm done, I would like our movement to just completely abolish and uh, and destroy Ruckmanism and their heresies and their doctrines. Ruckmanism. <laughs> yeah, I gotta say pause because you see that's the true intent of this film that we just talked about earlier. They they just they hate dispensationalism because I I agree I think that they are. Had conspiring with Rome or something like that to try to just attack dispensational teaching because everything about dispensationalism destroys everything Roman Catholic and really a lot of the heresies from fundamental Baphics like these guys, their little replacement theology, all the weird stuff, you know, they're quote unquote, you know, always the same uh, salvation throughout the Old New Testaments, everything just destroys them and they just can't handle that. So they have to come after dispensational teaching. Yep, absolutely. They have to burn the heretic, in other words. Yeah. Yep. All right. Continue. And one way we're going to do that is by just facing dispensationalism and destroying it. Because that's our goal. <laughs> our goal, and we're not hiding it, is to destroy dispensationalism. To bury it in the ground six feet deep and it never comes back. But you let me hang around. I'll be after your soul. I'm out to get it. Uh, yeah, uh, yeah, that's called soul winning. Okay? Yeah, um, that's what Ruckman meant, you know. And that's real soul winning, preaching repentance. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Cut up his video to make him look like an idiot. Yeah. yeah. All right. Oh, disgusting. <sighs> okay, where are we at here? Who are the men responsible for this perverse teaching? Isn't that hard? Yeah. Dramatic, dramatic music. The right. beating heartbeat in the very like high tone. Teaching perverse things. Oh no! Dun dun. <laughs> 
Ephesus was such a false apostle to seek the workers transforming themselves into the apostles of Christ. And no marvel for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. You know how many calls has to do anything? Are upheld as being these great men of God. And they're basically. Yeah. Uh, hey, Princess, why don't we talk about one of your gods, Jack Hiles? Yeah. Okay. They won't talk about him. And the guy was so stinking wicked. I mean, even even the most ardent defender of Jack Hiles has to admit, yeah, he kind of covered up there for his son's sex perversion. And, you know, and, and yeah, there was the soul winner. His biggest soul winner was actually convicted of molesting children, you know. But uh, let's let's not make documentaries on Jack Hiles. Let's go after Ruckman, you know. Yeah. So we're going to skip ahead here. You know, they go through the thing of uh, Darby's translation. And, um, you know, which I'm not a fan of, of John Nelson Darby by any means. Uh, so, you know, whatever. Um, I'm not going to offend, defend John Nelson Darby. And I don't need John Nelson Darby because we have the King James Bible. Yep. And, and the teachings of pre-trib rapture and dispensationalism were around a lot longer than John Nelson Darby. Let's continue. Angels, these systematic changes to promote false doctrine. You say, well, what's the big deal? You know, I mean, yeah, he was off on those things, but he was right on the pre-tribulation doctrine. He was right about the Jews. Okay. I love this. Again, showing the level of uh, really shoddy research here. It says, at the summons of the spiritual father of the Jewish state, Theodore Herzl. Okay. Uh, let's just look up this real quickly here. Um, Theodore Herzl. At where did the thing go? Right there. Right? First of all, his name is not spelled with an E there. It's like that. And secondly, you can see the resemblance to me here, you know. So I'm trying to get my beard that long there so I can look like Theodore Herzl. <laughs> people think I'm a crypto Jew anyways, you know. <laughs> so, but, you know, it's just funny. Again, look at the look at the research. They're calling this guy Theodore Herzl. That's not Theodore Herzl. This is Theodore Herzl right here. Right? Can't even get their facts straight. I mean, my word. So I just thought that was kind of funny. I had to write that one down. Yeah. I also find it funny, too, that a lot of these so called Jews, you know, that are like running the banking stuff, they're not even real Jews. They just follow Judaism, you know? Yep. They're not even from the nation of Israel. They're all white European. Yep. So well, let's go a little bit here. You're following a guy who wrote his own Bible, who inserted his own theology and ideologies and false teachings within that Bible. And you're saying that those two doctrines are right? You see, today you have these dispensational Baptists who will ardently fight against the NIV. They'll take a stand against the ESV and these modern versions of the Bible. Yet their foundation for eschatology and their foundation for their view on Israel stems from a man who wrote a Bible that reads just like these modern versions. No, that's your goal. No, we don't. But you need to melt and be poured down your throat. Amen. And and really, um, I think so far overreached itself that it 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 just chopped up the Bible and lost a sense of right. unity. Right. What resulted from Darby's departure was a new way of viewing the church and history that still pervades much of evangelical Christian thought today. It is positively stated in 2 Timothy chapter 3 that the church would fail and become as bad as the heathens. That's what he said. So he sees himself as some church savior. You see, if you're claiming to bring in a new way, you're basically stating that you're doing something that's never been done before. So this argument by Gene Kim that states that during the Dark Ages, no one had the word of God. And in the 1800s, John Nelson Darby came on the scene and began to reinforce something that was taught before is a fallacy. Why? Because John Nelson Darby specifically said, I'm bringing in a new way. Okay. So, what do we know about John Nelson? Okay, which one are you going to say something? No, I'm just like, okay. You know, oh, using okay. G. Kim's, you know, little argument saying that, oh, well, because they're, they didn't really have scripture in the dark ages, and now all of a sudden, the new revelation, that's what we go by by John Nelson Darby. That's a really weak argument, you know, yeah. mental illness. Yep. Okay, continue. And Darby. Here's what we need to know about John Nelson Darby, the father of dispensationalism. The man who <laughs> invented dispensationalism was not even saved. 
That was a new team. Might put a sock in now. Yeah, you got to get impressed when they when they yell like that. It's just you know really good. <laughs> but you know, again, we we proved earlier that it was being taught as early as the second century. Mm-hmm. You know, and also, you know, let's um, you know, let's just say for example, let's give them a little bit a little bit more rope to hang themselves with for a minute here. But let's just say for one second that it was invented recently. That it was invented in the. Let's even give them more leeway. Let's say it was invented in the 1900s. Who cares when or when or when it came out? Because it only matters what the book says. If this book said something contrary to what somebody said 16, <laughs> 1,500 years ago, I don't care. It's getting overthrown because scripture trumps all of it. It's about what this book says, not what some guy said this or that or their characters. I mean, whatever. It's all about the scriptures. If the scriptures say something and you see it clearly, you go by it. Yep, absolutely. All right, we'll continue. One of the greatest books you can get on dispensations is this book by Clarence Larkin, the greatest book on dispensational truth in the world. Clarence Larkin can be referred to as John Nelson Darby's scribe. He simply took the teachings of Darby and made systematic charts that basically would illustrate their dispensational truth. This guy was born in 1850, he died in 1924. John Nelson Darby created it, but Clarence Larkin packaged it. Because dispensationalism is so complicated, you need like multiple charts to even try to grasp it. At the age of 21, <laughs> An architect which would later aid him in publicizing his book the greatest book on dispensational truth in the world now, let me just say this about that book i don't even recommend it to people because he and they don't even bring this up but clarence larkin uh quoted the revised version westcott and hort's bible so he was not a bible believing christian you know clarence larkin so you know i don't even recommend the book i have a copy of it but you know i just I stopped reading it because he kept going to the revised version and they never, they never bring that point up. But again, see, they'll use anybody that's, that's really kind of got weird stuff and whatever else, you know, they'll, they'll use breaker and, and, you know, predominantly him saying really her- heretical things. And then they'll, they'll try to demonize the rest of dispensationalists because of some wing nut like that. So, yeah. all right, let's continue. I mean, that sounds like a real humble guy, right? I mean, he writes a book on dispensationalism. He titles it The Greatest Book on Dispensationalism in the World. This is one of the first books I, I read after I got saved, and I cannot put it down. The Bible is amazing. The Bible is a, just an amazing, amazing book. And if you talk to dispensationalism, they're always telling you Clarence Larkin's books, you got to read his books, you got to study his charts. You know, he is the man that packaged it. No, I don't. Okay, I don't reference any man. I reference what the Bible says, okay? Never once do I reference any man when it comes to what I believe and what the scripture says. Okay, give me a break. You know, if anybody asks me or whatever, I'm just like, I just show you what the scripture says. This is what it says. Okay? You don't like it, then whatever. You know, I never, ever reference a man. Never. Mm-hmm. Anyway, you can continue. Yep. He is the man that made it basically formatted in a way where these people can grasp it and understand it. Clarence Larkin was actually an Episcopalian, but in 1882, the same year that John Nelson Darby died, he converted to become a Baptist. And in fact, two years after his so-called conversion, he was ordained to be a Baptist pastor. It was during this time that he began to adopt and adhere to the tenets of dispensationalism, drawing and designing the dispensational charts. Then in 1918, he completed his work on dispensational truth. What's interesting about about Clarence Larkin is, you know, he was an architect, and the Freemasons will use that phrase about God, and Clarence Larkin used a lot of terminology that actually aligns with the occult. He used a lot of symbolism and drawings that that fall right in hand with what the Rosicrucians taught. Rosicrucians are a secret society inside of the Catholic Church. Rosicrucian simply means rosy cross. That was their symbol. And a lot of the occult teachings and golf. Okay, what the what what in the world? You know, leave stuff up long enough and actually discuss it. You know, I mean, whatever. 
a bunch of losers. I mean, my word. We'll continue here a little bit. I don't know if or should I just skip some of this stuff. Yeah, go ahead. The whole thing of Clarence Larkin. I don't recommend Clarence Larkin, so whatever. You know, just study the Bible. That's what you need. I got to go here to this one spot. Uh, let's see where it is here. Adam Fannin makes a major boo boo. It's kind of funny. Preachers mm -hmm. in their seminaries and Bible colleges. And this is how dispensationalism was really distributed into the pulpits and into the hands of preachers all across the country. Yep. Um, I got to say this too, real quick. You know, it's, oh, it's this great conspiracy of dispensational theology got into all the churches. Um, growing up in church buildings and going to a lot of different ones, I never heard about dispensational truth. Yeah, you know? me neither. Yep. <laughs> so another fail. Yeah, conferences were really important. And uh, the establishment of Bible colleges and Dallas Theological Seminary, that was all part of a concerted effort to spread this dispensational movement. That was very successful for a time. And so these Bibles were getting distributed all over, uh, you know, rural America, small town churches, millions, uh, millions, all over. And uh, the Bible salesman would get the Bibles for free. They began publishing and giving them away for free to Bible students and seminaries like and Moody Bible in the big one in Texas. <laughs> Moody Bible in Texas. <clears throat> That's interesting. Um, Moody Bible Institute is in Chicago. <laughs> okay, uh, Chicago is in Illinois. Are right there, Adam Fannin? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I just love that. I mean, the, the the research that went into this documentary is just, oh boy, just great, you know? <laughs> yeah, really. <laughs> but then they yeah. go, oh, C.I. Schofield, we'll skip past that. Again, you know, I don't care one bit about C.I. Schofield, you know, so whatever. But we'll skip ahead here. Now they start getting into Ruckman. We'll do the rest of it from now on. Where do they go from here? What do they do with this information? Well, if you got a Scofield Bible, throw it in the trash. Yeah, uh, Ruckman is pretending he's a, he's mimicking and mocking people that are possessed with devils. That's called that sermon's called hypocrites in the church. You know, <laughs> it's funny that they'll pick the they cut a little clip out to make him look bad. Yeah. So, little papal hit piece here. How supposed to be keep right now on how it goes? Well, you got five fourths of blood. Flesh and blood shall not hurt the kingdom of God. So what happens? If Tim LaHaye couldn't find him, how he couldn't find him, none of them could find him. You find where you go, all your clothes collapse there in that place you're sitting. And that five quarts of blood just stops those clothes mm -hmm. clear through with blood. And five quarts here, five quarts there, five quarts here, five here, five here, five, here, five ten, fifteen, twenty, twenty, mm -hmm. one, thirty, thirty, twenty, four, one hundred, two hundred, three hundred quarts of blood, all of that. Beautiful carpet <laughs> and all them beautiful seats are soaked in blood. <laughs> I guess that's that the eerie music in the background is supposed to make it oh, this is dangerous or something. He's yeah. talking about the you know being caught up and what gets left behind. Yeah, you know, give me a break. Like it's just some kind of terrorist thing, it's all oh, dangerous. <sighs> People are so desperate. Yeah. Talking about the founders of dispensationalism and those who promoted it, one name I want to bring up is the name of Peter S. Ruckman. Peter Ruckman is kind of like the father of a lot of these Baptist churches when it comes to who they look back to. Peter Ruckman is really the man that brought dispensationalism into the independent fundamental Baptist movement. And he has birthed these bastards such as Gene Kim, right. such as Robert Breaker. These are the bastard children of Peter Ruckman. No, they're not. Uh, no, they're not. Um, I actually, Ruckman openly condemned Robert Breaker. Yeah. Fraud and things, you know. Um, yep. As far as Gene Kim is concerned, I had I have some friends that, that went down and actually talked to Brian Donovan, who was the assistant pastor to Peter Ruckman. He's currently the head pastor now of Bible Baptist Church. 
And he said, yeah, he said, Gene Kim really went off the deep end. So um, both Gene Kim and Robert Breaker are both rejected by the you know, Bible Baptist Church. So yeah. Yeah, give me a break. You know, a lot of people think that Peter Ruckman is a great man of God. Well, you know what? Why is it that in 2018, everyone who is a fan of Peter Ruckman and loves Peter Ruckman isn't saved? <laughs> okay. you know, what does that say about that man when all of his followers are a bunch of damnable heretics? Uh, according to Steven Anderson, anybody that doesn't agree with him is a damnable heretic. Yeah. <laughs> Give me a break. Yeah. They all look back to Ruckman and what he taught, but he had a lot of weird views. And the fact that he believed that people are saved differently in the Old Testament is enough to call him heretic. Ezekiel 320, you saw it, Mike. Ruckmanites yeah. today are the ones who have brought this heresy in to the IFB movement. <laughs> Again, um, I literally sat in the office of Pastor Keith Schweitzer, Mount Zion Baptist Church, Denver, Pennsylvania, and I said, what do you think of Ruckman? And he said, I hate that guy. Um, most Baptists in the independent fundamental Baptist system hated Ruckman's guts. Yep. Uh, Ruckman didn't bring dispensational theology into the Baptist world. Very few Baptists even agreed with the guy. You know, a bunch of idiots. You guys both know brought it into conservative fundamentalism back in the 1800s. That was not the independent federal Baptist movement. You fast forward, you know, many years later, you've got a lot of liberalism that causes a group of, of churches to take on the name of independent fundamental Baptists, not connected to a den denomination, but we were, you know, zealous, soul winning fundamentalist Christians. And Peter Ruckman was able to infiltrate the IFP movement. Peter Ruckman is <laughs> very highly esteemed among Baptists. No, he isn't. No, he isn't. Oh, he isn't. Give me a break. <laughs> Peter Ruckman also taught that the English. The, they, Bob Jones University started out as a Methodist school. Bob Jones was a Methodist. Senior was a Methodist. And then the Methodist went, you know, ultra liberal because it's a whole system of satanic people from the very beginning. But that's a whole other issue. But, uh, you know, and I used to stand for the Methodists, and I'm, I've changed my position on that. The Methodists, old-time Methodists, were a bunch of stinking, rotten heretics. Uh, Brother Jeremy and I talk about that, and uh, we'll be talking more about that in the future, but side issue. But, you know, Bob Jones University became a, they're now this hardcore Baptist school. They burned Ruckman's commentaries there. Okay? Yeah. If you stand up for Peter Ruckman, you'll get kicked out of the school there. So yeah. to say he's highly esteemed among the Baptists is just stupid nonsense. Mm -hmm. so, yeah, he has, I believe he has, uh, isn't it publicized his letters between him and some of the professors at Bob Jones? Yeah. The TV? Yeah. Yep. Let's continue. King James Bible trumped the Greek New Testament. Uh, yeah, well, the King James <laughs> Does trump the uh, Greek because we have a complete book right here. It is superior to the Greek because we have the complete book, Old and New Testament, right in our hands. So, yeah. Number one, he did not believe abortion was murder. And so I don't teach that abortion is uh, murder, like the brethren do. And so that's the uh, reason I'm considered a heretic to some of the brethren. So basically, it could be nine months, uh, you know, a nine month baby in the womb. What's I got to do a dispensational Yeah. Number uh, yeah, uh, uh, they'll say say a bite there, and uh, you know <laughs> nah, because nah. because Reckman said that abortion's not murder, then you can have an abortion. Uh, oh my word! No, that's not. Uh, Ruckman plainly taught that abortion was wrong. Okay, the debate was over when the child becomes an actual, you know, being. That was the whole debate there. But Ruckman was not for abortion. You know. I mean, we, uh, to keep track of the lies in this thing, you know, you need a lot of paper and a lot of, you know, marks on it. Two, yeah. having a physical relationship with someone makes you married. He taught, you know, he taught oh. all different between fornication oh. and adultery. If, if you have a physical relationship with someone, you're married to them. And you say, that's weird. Yeah, you know, when you've been married three times, you probably want to just try to, like, not make marriage that special. Number three, he believes. Okay, again, that's not what Ruckman taught. 
all right? He was saying the thing that consummates the marriage is the marriage bed, the physical action. That's why the Bible says don't join your body with a harlot because two become one flesh, all right? Doesn't mean that you married her and you're officially husband and wife now or something. You know, it's just continue. Yeah. Everyone becomes a 33-year-old man in heaven. Ladies, I hope you're excited for that. Look what the Bible says in Acts chapter 20, verse 29. The Bible says that we'll be conformed to the image of Christ in the resurrection. In the resurrection, they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are as the angels of God in heaven. Where are female angels at in the Bible? You know, give me a break. For I know this, that after my departing shall grievous wolves enter in among you, not sparing the flock. Also of your own selves shall men arise speaking perverse things to draw away disciples after them. Because here's the thing. This man was not a Baptist. He was not saved. He was not, uh, you know, doesn't believe the things we believe. But he was able to come in and bring all of his false doctrine and false teaching. When you look to the preachers and the missionaries and the pastors, you look on their fruit. Uh, yeah, okay, Anderson. It's about your fruit there. You know, Prince. Yeah. Yeah. You know, you can't even keep a staff. You know. yeah. yeah, really. And, and how about the fruit that uh, Paul Wittenberger produces? Let's talk about oh, yeah. that. The ones of God. What's the fruit? Check the fruit. The tree is known by its fruit. Beware of false prophets which come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravening wolves. You shall know them by their fruit. <laughs> Thank you for exposing yourself, Here's Anderson. A timeline of Peter Ruckman's life. 1921. Peter S. Ruckman was born November 19th in Wilmington, Delaware. Okay, and this is important to disprove dispensationalism. This is how yeah. you destroy dispensationalism. Uh, when was Ruckman born? Who cares? <laughs> <laughs> Let's continue. 1944, married Jamie Bess May in March and graduated from the University of Alabama. 1949, made a profession of faith on the 14th of March and enrolled in Bob Jones University in the fall. 1950, ordained into the ministry in a Southern Baptist church. 1954, began to teach that salvation was by works during the Great Tribulation. Um, yeah. Revelation 14, verse 12, people. Just read it. Matthew 24, 13. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. You know. They don't, but and they're they're going to cover the scriptures here in just a second. Oh, that's right. No, they don't. Yeah, never. 1959. His first wife deserted him, according to his side of the story. Uh, she did. She left him, <clears throat> and he tried everything he could to get her back. And she was fornicating with multiple men. And he still wanted to keep her as his wife. And she got, she filed for divorce from him, you know. Good night. 1962, his first wife divorced him. 1972, married Sherry Rubin, divorced wife of one of his former students at Pensacola Bible Institute, and submitted resignation to Brent Baptist Church after a third of the congregation voted against him. 1988, his second. And they didn't accept his resignation, by the way. They kept him on as pastor. Yeah. They were talking yeah. about that. And because his uh, divorces were actually scriptural. Okay. His wife divorced him. 1989, married for third time to Pamela Irene Huggins, a member of his church who was 27 years younger. Also guessed that the rapture would occur between the 14th of May and the 20th of June of 1989. So he said. Okay. Uh, where's the proof on that? Which book? Which article? They don't show any proof of it. Mm -hmm. Did you guess that? And by the way, Ruckman said that uh, he taught that he believes it's going to be in the spring of some, you know, whatever year. 
And he said, you know, different people say, well, I thought you said he was going to come this year. And, and I remember him saying different times, you know, I think he's going to come every year. Yeah. But never set an official date. That is a lie. And they don't show any proof. Again, there's no proof. No, you know, Bible Baptist Bulletin issue number, you know, nothing. They don't show any proof. Good night, people. And as far as his wife being 27 years younger than him, um, when you're in your 70s, uh, okay, it really doesn't matter if she's 27 years younger. Okay. Yeah. Setting <laughs> date for the rapture. 2009, published the Ruckman Reference Bible. 2016, died April 21st. 2018, Ruckman's fifth child, Peter Ruckman Jr., allegedly killed his two sons before taking his own life in an apparent murder suicide discovered on March 5th. Okay. First of all, that, because this really ticks me off. It, uh, old John, Cla oh, excuse me, Max the Flower Bauer. Um, mm -hmm. he, he came out with this whole thing too and was attacking Ruckman because his son committed suicide. You know, and it wasn't allegedly. He did. He killed two of his own sons and then killed himself, Peter Ruckman Jr. The guy was a university um, professor and he was going to some liberal Methodist church. Uh, he wasn't doing what Ruckman told him to do. Right. Mm -hmm. This. And to blame Peter Ruckman after he's dead and gone for what his son did is just the height of absurdity. It's just sick. Absolutely sick. And again, go back to Jack Hiles. Jack Hiles, his son, David, was was having sexual affairs with multiple women, photo, you know, photographing it. He married. He divorced one of his wives and married a porn star for crying mm -hmm. out loud. And they killed one of their children. And, and Jack okay. Hiles covered the whole thing up. Where's the expose of that? Yeah. But you'll go after Peter Ruckman and blame him for his son's death after Ruckman died two years later. Just, oh, my word is sickening. Mm -hmm. And again, you say, oh, well, yeah, that's just his personal life, his private life. Just remember, God gave us qualifications for a reason. This okay. guy, well, not only a wife. You know what? Uh, I was just going to say this uh, little you know, Jiminy Cricket here. Um, what about the people that left your church? You know, all those false converts are against you now. Yep. You know, I, I've read many stories about all these uh, women that were uh, supposedly harassed by some of the staff members there at this guy's church. Mm -hmm. You know, where's the fruit on that? You know, or where's the report on that? Yeah. Yep. And how about Donnie Romero running around with prostitutes and buying marijuana and gambling with church money. Yeah. Yep. You know? Yep. Oh, and right. then Stephen Anderson covers it up and is like, oh, it's no big deal. Yep. And and don't bet for one second that they aren't going to resurrect Rom Romero at some point in time. Yeah. Don't bet for one second. Because they they very craftily, they, they came out and they, quote unquote, attacked him and, and, you know, exposed his sins. And then they just switched everything over to Adam Fannin and just dumped everything, all their hatred on him. You know? Yeah. Disgusting. I think couldn't rule three wives. You see, Peter Ruckman is praised as this great man of God who taught the multitudes, and they praise Peter Ruckman as being some 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 wonderful man. And, and what does the Bible say? He's like a minister of righteousness. But you know what his end should be? According to his works, according to the Bible. We're beginning by just talking about these founders of dispensationalism, you know, exposing uh, the founders and examining the founders and what we find is this every single one of these men Is not someone we should be listening to for theology it's not and, and by the way examining the works of Peter Ruckman um, He put out hundreds of men going out into mission fields and going and pastoring churches all over the world I, I personally met uh, in you know in person uh, two PBI graduates and they're both great men of God you know, both wonderful men, and I've had correspondence with multiple PBI graduates. They're not all messed up like Robert Breaker and Gene Kim. Yeah. So, you know, give me a break. The works of Ruckman, all the stuff that, that guy put out, I don't agree with everything he said, obviously, but, you know, he did some some really great things. Mm -hmm. so, you know, and he, he examined the works of Jack Hiles, and every single time you hear about Baptist, you know, church perversion or whatever else, Nearly every time it ties, ties back to uh, Hiles Anderson College. You know, just satanic. Let's continue. Not someone that we should be listening to 
to understand the word of God. And they say, yeah, but you know, John Nelson Darby had his issues and C.I. Schofield had issues and, you know, Peter Ruckman, he had his failures and his issues. But, you know, at the end of the day, we can still learn from these men. At the end of the day, we can still gain wisdom from these teachers. Really? You know, do men gather grapes of thorns? Well, can you get figs of thistles? Can we glean wisdom and proper fruits from these corrupt trees? You and the funny thing is, these are the same heretics that say all it is is just salvation is just belief. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Turning from unbelief to belief. And you have no right to, to judge somebody's, you know, life and, and see if their life changed and whatever else. And yet they're doing that exact thing with Ruckman. Yeah. Yeah, they're absolute hypocrites. Yeah. You cannot, according to them, understand doctrine. You can't understand the Bible. You can't understand basic salvation without having an understanding of dispensationalism. You know, they'll say, well, you know, I don't agree with C.I. Schofield and the fact that he believed and taught the gap theory. But you know what? I do believe uh, in Zionism. I do believe that the Jews are God's chosen that's people. That's a terrible heresy. I'm sorry, what? I was just saying, wow, that's such a terrible heresy the gap theory yeah you know it's just a theory yeah no big deal do? mean doctrine out of an unclean tree such as john nelson darby not one who can bring a clean doctrine out of an unclean resource such as c.i schofield and peter ruckman not one is it possible <laughs> to extract good doctrine from a bad tree well according to matthew 7 it's impossible why? Because you can't get good fruit from a bad tree. And you know what? John Nelson Darby is uh, a bad tree. We can't do it. Stop for a second. Okay there, Mohammed. Let me say this. Um, <laughs> I have not read one book, one article, any reference of any kind about dispensationalism when I got saved. And I learned dispensationalism on my own from the Bible. So if you want proof of it, I'm living proof of it. Never read anything from Ruckman. Never read anything from Schofield or Darby, or Larkin, never read any of these books or commentaries or anything like that. The only thing I did was when after I got out of the street preaching movement, I sat down and studied the Bible myself. And I came to the conclusion that there was time periods in the Bible where things changed. And I and I, it was clear as day for me in the scriptures. I could see Matthew 24 is clearly different than what Paul taught. I could see Acts chapter 2 is clearly different than what Paul taught as well. You know, to, to sit here and say, oh, it's a to sit here and say oh, all this fruit comes from these people all these people all these followers of these guys this is the fruit of it but yet you take somebody like me who's never read a single thing on any of these men you know what do you do with that yep you know i just want to say that I'm just really getting on my nerves here yeah all right let's continue Joseph Smith. We can't do it with Charles Case Russell. We can't do it from Joe Olstein or from any other corrupt tree. So John Nelson Darby, C.S. Schofield, and Peter Rutter are not the exception. You see, they're saved people. Baptists. Saved. They believe in once saved, always saved. But they're being deceived by the dispensations. Because they've been ingrained to think and to believe uh, the subject regarding the Jews. They've been ingrained to think and to believe this matter of the pre-tribulation rapture, this false fallacy of the church age, and the false teaching of the misconception of the times of the Gentiles, and all these teachings that have been ingrained in them, they think they're being disloyal to the Bible by not believing in those things. No, you're actually adhering to the Bible if you reject those things. <laughs> yeah. Okay. <laughs> We believe in a doctrine called dispensationalism. In other words, we believe in dividing verses to the right group of people and the right time period. Because if you don't divide the verses, then you're going to combine them all together and come up with a bunch of major wrong doctrine. You see, the most damnable heresy of dispensationalism is this teaching that people were saved differently throughout the Bible, that there are different <laughs> Gospels. So there, there are several different Gospels in the Bible. There's at least five different Gospels in the Bible. So that's why it's so important to understand dispensationalism, to see where are we in the Bible, and which Gospel is to us. But the problem with that is, is that in the New Testament, in Acts chapter 10, verse 43, 
The Bible says that to him, speaking of Christ, give all the prophets witness. That through his name, whosoever believeth in him shall receive remission of sins. That's talking about the prophets of the Old Testament, where the dispensations were saying, well, they had a different gospel. It was by faith and by works. But the Bible tells us that their message was that whosoever believeth in him shall receive remission of sins. The Bible is very clear that that a man is not justified by the deeds of the law. And that Okay, now here what they do is they go, they'll go with Paul and Epistle type of stuff, and then they'll they'll say, um, well, see, this, you know, this is this is what was taught throughout all the, the whole church or throughout all the, the whole Bible. The whole Bible talks the same thing. And, uh, you know, just deceiving people like crazy. Um, there's something I was going to bring up here. I'll get back to it. But we'll continue here. It's not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us. And Romans chapter 4 flat out destroys this, this dispensational argument. What so it says here that if Abraham were justified by works, he had were of the glory and not before God. But what saith the scripture? Abraham believed God and it was counted unto him for righteousness. Okay, what did he believe? Go ahead, brother. I was just going to say Deuteronomy 6, 24 and 25 says, And the Lord commanded us to do all these statutes. To fear the Lord our God for our good always, that He might preserve us alive as this day, and it shall be our righteousness if we observe to do all these commandments before the Lord our God as He commanded us. Huh? So they were saved by faith? I don't think so. No. No, your life. Yeah. And not only that, but Abraham is a typology. So is David. They are typologists. That doesn't mean they're the same as we are today. They're a type of what we were going to be. Mm -hmm. I mean, you can't sit there and confuse a typology with a, you know, what it is now, the doctrine for now. I mean, you know, it's the same thing as uh, as uh, the rapture typology in uh, Genesis, the um, uh, Sodom and Gomorrah, the being struck with blindness. That's a, that's a full-on typology of the rapture, but you can't, you know, you can't go there and say that it is the same as the rapture is, is going to be. I mean, it's, it's just a typology of foreshadowing what's going, what's to come. Yep. Absolutely. You know, and, and what was the thing that Abraham did? It was an action. It was a work. Yep. It was a work. Go sacrifice your son. Mm -hmm. you know, there wasn't any kind of a faith there. The faith was that God's going to provide himself a lamb for the sacrifice. I mean, yeah, God, right. God will take care of this thing. Don't worry about it, son. You know, right. But he still had to work. He still had to do an action. Yeah. Let me uh, say this as well, uh, too. You know, it's funny. These guys right here will quote Leviticus to say, you need to put the adulterer to death. You know, you need to put the sodomite to death. Mm -hmm. You know, have they even read the whole book of Levit Leviticus? It's all works. They had to do all these things to stay clean. You know, if you don't do a certain thing, you're unclean so many days, you know, whatever. What about all that? But yet they tell people to put adulterers and sodomites to death. You know, I find that weird. You know, but anyway, you can go ahead. Yep. Yeah, they actually had a picnic video or something. The the scene that I have in my no face palm challenge where Anderson's shooting that gun, <laughs> AR-15 or something. And, uh, and they actually had a clip in there where they were they were slaughtering chickens. And this one girl, you know, pulls a, the head of a chicken off and she's got blood all over her hands. And she says, uh, their blood shall be upon them. And she puts her bloody hands up and she points to her sleeve because she's wearing one of these marching design or one of these T-shirts that they put out. And it said Leviticus 20 verse 13. You know, she's bragging about having blood on her hands. And, you know, <laughs> again, that's that's the papist thing here. And that's why they're just chomping at the bit. They can't wait for the quote unquote righteous government to come in. So they can start killing heretics. You know, that's the real thing here. And don't think for a second that these people won't come after Bible believers if they can have the chance. Because they would. They'd kill any single, you know, every single one of us. Reckon of grace, but of death. But to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. And then David, he was in the Old Testament. And David said that he spake of the blessings of the man and God imputed the righteousness without works. How in the world could we use David as an illustration 
of being saved without works if they were saved by works in the Old Testament. Can you <laughs> okay. Um, how about the guy that was walking there and they and the Ark of the Covenant kind of tilted a little bit and he reached up and grabbed it and God just dropped him dead? Mm -hmm. did, did God impute uh, righteousness without, you know, the deeds of the law to that guy? And again, I mean, yeah, exactly. And again, you know, as I said earlier, Psalm 51, verse 11, cast me not away from thy presence and take not thy Holy Spirit from me. You know, mm -hmm. Ephesians 4.30, grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby ye are sealed unto the day of redemption. They are two different contradicting things here. We can't have the Holy Spirit taken from us. So their whole argument falls null and void when you read that verse. Yep. Right. And again, what about the, uh, go ahead. I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm just going to say again, it's a type. And they take that as a type as, as you know, doctrinally for them. Yeah. All right, you can go ahead. Never mind. Okay. And then Jesus, who brought in the New Testament, and he was coming at the tail end of the Old Testament, said that for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. See how this dispensational salvation is the most foolish, unbiblical garbage that just completely contradicts what we're reading in Scripture. <laughs> and they say ridiculous things like people are saved the same in the Old Testament as the New Testament are. The people in the Old Testament are saved by looking forward to the cross. The people in the New Testament are saved by looking backwards to the cross. Just ridiculous things. And so from before the Old Testament, during the order of Melchizedek, it was by faith, not by works. During the Old Testament, David said it was by faith, not by works. No, he didn't. Really? Okay, princess, where's the verse? <laughs> maybe the the pinko papist uh, version <laughs> continue uh, you know it's funny they quote jesus christ and said that he came in he was born at the tail end of the new testament okay matthew 10 33 whosoever shall deny me before men him i also deny before my father which is in heaven hmm i mean they can lose their salvation during the time of jesus christ yeah because the perfect sacrifice was not offered yet. Duh. Yeah. Yeah. Continuing. And right even before the New Testament even started at the death of Christ, Jesus is saying it's faith, not by works. Specifically, Robert Breaker will say salvation was different in the Old Testament. In fact, with Adam and Eve, it was by works because they did not eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. But here's the problem with that. Before Adam and Eve ate of the tree of knowledge of good and evil, they weren't sinners. They were innocent, meaning they were not in need of salvation. It wasn't after they ate of the tree. The Bible says, wherefore, as by one man, sin entered into the world and death by sin. And so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. So how can it be that they were saved by not eating of the tree when they didn't need salvation until after they ate of the tree? They weren't sinners until after they ate of the tree. You go to first Corinthians. Okay. Um, then what was the salvation that they had after they ate of the tree? You know? Yep. The burial and resurrection of Jesus Christ? <laughs> okay. Luke 1 through 4 tells us the only way to be saved is the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. How could someone have been saved back here that way if Jesus hadn't died yet, wasn't buried, and rose again? And he says, see, the prophets had a different message. They didn't preach the death, burial, and resurrection. They didn't talk about Christ. They, talk, they said they had to be saved by works. Well, let's see if that. You know, I just got to say something here. Um, a lot of this stuff is just so simple, you know, and it and these idiots come in, they overcomplicate things, and we have to answer them, you know, with a lot of scripture. But um, a little child could understand, that could read, just hand them the Bible and say, find me the word Jesus in the Old Testament. Okay. Uh, nobody preached Jesus Christ in the Old Testament. Yep. All right. His name's not there. You know, continue. That's true. Well, what about Acts chapter 26? Having therefore obtained help of God, I continue into this day, witnessing both to small and great, saying none other things than those which the prophets and Moses did say should come. Now, what did they say? Look at verse 23. That Christ should suffer and that he should be the first that should rise from the dead.
and should show light unto the people, unto the Gentiles. That's the prophets. That's Moses. What? <laughs> Come on. Uh, they were prophesying that there would be the Messiah would come someday. They weren't preaching that he came, that he came and died on the cross and was buried and rose again. Yeah. Again, show us the scriptures here. You know, Abdullah. <laughs> Abdullah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And, and all they had back then was the Old Testament. All right. <laughs> so Moses was preaching that. The prophets were preaching that. John the Baptist <laughs> preached that. And the apostle Paul preached that. He says, I'm not saying anything different. But you know what Robert Breaker says? No, these guys are liars. The prophets didn't. Did it talk about Jesus? <laughs> hey, they're liars. So if this is the same message that the prophets <laughs> spoke and Moses spoke, why didn't he insert works as well? If they say, no, it's by believing in my works as well. Well, what was the witness? That through his name, through his name, well, they didn't know the name of Jesus. He was called the Lord. That works in conjunction. Okay. Uh, then show us the, the verse in the Old Testament there, Princess, that says the Lord died and was buried and rose again the third day, according to the scriptures. Okay. If Jesus, if the name Jesus wasn't the Old Testament, but the Lord was preached for salvation. Show it to us. Mm -hmm. Guy's an idiot. With every other gospel presentation we've seen in the Bible. People back here weren't saying the same way that we are today. The only way that you can say they're all saved the same. Is they were all saved by God's grace. And I would agree with you. God has always had grace on people to save them. Noah, the Bible says, found grace in God's eyes. Over here, we're saved by grace through faith. But then we looked at a verse that people that are under the law had to live in that, that law and do the works. So there were some works involved in the law. You know, Noah, there were some works involved. Had Noah not built that boat, none of us would be here today. Well, we're not told to build a big boat. So do you see how God deals differently with different people in different time periods? Bunch of liars. <laughs> Bunch of perverse liars. Funny Robert. Give <laughs> yeah, Robert credit, credit, but, but he, uh, he uh, pretty much did what they were saying. <laughs> yeah. Okay, we got to go into the Muslim hissy fed here. All right. Divide the word of truth. Why don't you go read Acts chapter 26? Why don't you read Acts chapter 10? Why don't you read the rest of the Bible? Why don't you compare scripture with scripture? You know why? Because you're a natural man, and the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God. Neither can he know them for their spiritually discerned. <laughs> the dispensation is one to get up and say, see, there's different gospels from which some having swerved have turned aside and the vain jangling, desiring to be teachers of the law. Understanding neither what they say nor where they affirm. That's exactly what these people are. And he specifically said this. I couldn't believe that he said this. Let's say the rapture. Okay, now check this out. Again, look at look how they'll look for you know goofball breaker here, you know, to say something really stupid. And that and we've attacked this, you know. But see, they'll use this stupid thing to prove that all dispensationalists are are believing the same heresy check it out it takes place and i'm going and you're watching this video on youtube or someplace and you're just like wow the rapture happened we are really in this time period and there's a man over the whole world that took over and he said now everyone's got to take this mark and you weren't thinking and you took a little rfid chip in your in your hand and you think well what do i do how, how can i because when jesus comes he's going to put me in hell because i took that mark the bible told me not to Look what Jesus says in Matthew chapter 5 and verse 30. Matthew 5 30, he says, And if thy right hand offend thee, cut it off and cast it from thee. For it is profitable for thee that one of thy members should perish, and not that thy whole body should be cast into hell. I'll tell you what, if you're in the tribulation and you took that mark of the beast in your hand, you're going to have to cut that hand off. Well, if that's not a work, I don't know what is. It's best not to take the mark. But if you take it, chop it off. He said, well, what about those people that take the mark in their in their forehead? Uh, well. <laughs> and I can't believe this. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Excuse me. We've all attacked that thing. It said Breaker's a stinking heretic. Yeah. You know, the, as far as the mark of the beast thing is concerned, it's not just taking the mark. It's worshiping the beast and his image. 
Yeah. You know? um, I actually have a video on Gene Kim saying the exact same thing. So, yeah, yeah, Gene Kim taught the exact same stuff, and yeah, they're both heretics for that. Yep. Let's continue. Say people will listen to this stupidity and not say, what in the world is this guy talking about? Hit the X button on the computer, turn him off, shoot him an email and say, you're a heretic. You know what? The Bible choose between my Lord and Savior being a false prophet or Sam Gip being a false prophet. And you know what? Let Sam Gip be a curse. Let Bill Brady be a curse. Let all these guys, Gene, Kim, Robert Breaker, let them die and go to hell if they want to reject the gospel of Christ. It's been the same salvation all throughout history. It's always been about that. That was almost now, impressive. A lot of people will <laughs> disregard the Old Testament, not want to talk about the Old Testament, and they'll kind of have this dispensationalist attitude of, well, you know, that was written to them, and that was written for them, you know, but we're in the New Testament, so this is written for us. <laughs> Not one of these idiots follows the Old Testament. <laughs> and also, let, you know, they keep talking about this stuff, and, you know, the prophets talk about it as if it's been the same. Let me just read something real quick out of Luke here. Uh, Luke chapter 18, beginning in verse 31. Then he took unto him the twelve and said unto them, Behold, we go up to Jerusalem, and all the things that are written by the prophets concerning the Son of Man shall be accomplished. For he shall be delivered unto the Gentiles, and shall be mocked, and spitefully entreated, and, spite and spitted on. And they shall scourge him, and put him to death, and the third day he shall rise again. And they understood none of these things, and this saying was hid from them, neither knew, uh, neither knew they the things which were spoken. They didn't, they didn't know this stuff. This whole... This whole thing they're trying to say, they had no idea about the gospel at all. I mean, the Bible says it point blank. I mean, yep. these guys are ridiculous. Exactly. <laughs> uh, you know, Ephesians chapter 3, where it talks about that it's revealed to Paul, the gospel is revealed to Paul. Yep. They don't bring that verse up at all in the whole documentary. Yep. So. But the Bible is telling us here in 1 Corinthians 10 that those things were actually written for us. Even more so than they were written for them. No, it says that it was written for our learning. Yep. Okay. Not for us. Again, you know, oh, Stephen Anderson's King James only. He's a King James Bible believer. No, he is not. He's changed the Bible numerous times in his videos. You know, he did it with that Babylon, uh, you know, what is it called? The I forget what the USA. Babylon USA. There, there you go. He did it with Revelation chapter 17. He changed the, the the text of scripture right on camera, you know, to suit himself. He's not a Bible believer. And in fact, in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16, it says, All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. So, according to the Bible, if I'm going to be perfect or complete, thoroughly furnished to all good works, I need all scripture. The Bible is written. To us, the Bible is given to us, but not all the Bible is for us. All these things happen unto them for in samples, and they are written for our admonition upon whom the ends of the world are come. And what the Bible is teaching here in this scripture is that the things that happened in the Old Testament, those stories that he alluded to a little bit earlier in the chapter, were examples unto us, and the Bible says that they were written for our admonition upon whom the ends of the world are come. Does the Bible even use the word dispensation? Well, as a matter of fact, it does. Four times in the Bible do we find the term dispensation. By the way, it's only mentioned in the New Testament. So if there's seven dispensations, and most of them are before the dispensation of grace, okay, then why in the world wasn't it mentioned back then? <laughs> um, okay. Uh, we don't call it the dispensation of grace. That's just a thing God dispenses is grace. Okay. There's their title dispensation of grace. Yeah. Give me a break. I call it the, uh, I call it the time of the Gentiles. That's what I call it. Yeah. Yeah. Church age is problematic because church, uh, there are scriptures that refer to the church in the wilderness being, back there with the Jews, you know, yeah. Exodus and things. There, there's the word church is used for, you know, saints in the time of Jacob's trouble. 
So it's kind of problematic to call it the church age that we're in right now. Yeah, absolutely. So, yeah. You know, whatever. But yeah, it, it only appears four times. Dispensation only appears four times. And if there's seven dispensations, it should be in there seven times. <laughs> <laughs> what a nerd. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's continue. Here's what you need to understand. Dispensationalists teach that every dispensation was a test that God gave to man. Mankind fails their dispensation, which is why they say that every dispensation ends with evil. It ends with judgment. And God basically has to start over and try again a different way. Dispensation number one. Okay, God's not starting over and trying a different way. Yeah. Like, huh? You know? God's God's showing how much of a failure man is. Yeah. Yep. You know, God's not failing at anything. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's like they're attacking the Lord now. You know, they want to talk about us being unscriptural. What about these church buildings are in? You know, oh, yeah. wait for it. You'll you'll hear him in us here in a second after he finishes with these. All right. Go ahead. Yep. And they totally mess up the seven dispensations here. By the way, but we'll continue. Innocence. That's from the creation to the fall. Dispensation number two, conscience. That's from the fall to the flood. No, it isn't. Dispensation number three, human government. That's from the flood to Abraham. Dispensation three, promise. That's from no. Abraham to Moses. Dispensation number five, the law. That's from Moses to the cross. Dispensation number six, grace. That's from the cross to the rapture. Dispensation number seven, the kingdom. That's from the rapture through the millennium. Nah, nah. Well, huh? uh, yeah. Okay, so the time of Jacob's trouble and the millennial kingdom are one dispensation. Yeah, I just noticed that. I completely cut that out. Yeah. You know, yeah. Deep students of scripture here, boy, I'll tell you. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I've never heard of these names either. You know, Age of Promise, Age of Conscience. Where did that I, jump from? I heard those. That's, um, I heard that from, uh, actually, I think it's from some of the Schofield. Yeah, which proves that we don't follow him. It was wrong. Yeah. Exactly. You know, how about we just call it the pre-flood world, you know, the uh, time of Abraham, the Abrahamic covenant. Um, how about, you know, the law, giving of the law? You know, how about the kingdom age when Jesus Christ is born and the law and the prophets were until John? You know, yep. duh. <laughs> All right, continue. You know, you have the dispensation of innocence and Adam and Eve sin. You said, what is the Edenic dispensation? Everything was conditioned on, don't eat the tree. You have the dispensation of conscience, and it ends with the flood. And you're going to do right, and men had to follow their conscience. And it was the time in which men lived before the law. And basically, in the... Okay, notice that Breaker had it right there. The time before the law, between the Garden of Eden, the fall, and the before the law, but they just said it's before the flood, or it goes to the flood. Uh, no, you know, the second dispensation would be after the Garden of Eden up until the time that God gave the law to Moses. You know, that's the second dispensation. They, can, they can't even get their facts straight. <laughs> dispensation of conscience, people were supposed to just be led by their conscience. They're, it's like the Jiminy Cricket dispensation, right? Hey, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> dispensation. <laughs> <laughs> I bet you he's on. So, anyways, you're just oh my god, that's great. Do right, you know. But you know what's interesting is that in that dispensation, we have the story of Cain and Abel. And with Cain and Abel, they both brought a sacrifice to God. Abel brings the lamb, and Cain brings the fruit of the ground. You know, it's interesting because the Bible says that God did not accept one and he accepted the other one. But if it was a dispensation of conscience, why didn't God just go ahead and accept Cain's sacrifice? I mean, he was obviously bringing what he thought was the best thing. But that just goes to show you that it's never been follow your conscience. It's always been, you know, what God says and what his word tells us. <laughs> okay, again, what's this dispensation of conscience thing? I've never preached that, you know. I mean, what in the world? But you, you raise up this straw man argument. Well, it's dispensation of conscience, and we can prove that it's not by conscience. So therefore, you know, ridiculous. Let's continue. 
So then he's like, oh, what am I going to do with that? So now he's on some dispensation of human government. And look, if you've ever been to the DMV, you know this dispensation is doomed. So when you get to the fifth dispensation, and that's the dispensation of the law, they'll say that people were saved by keeping the law. And, you know, the dispensation of the law goes from Moses to the cross of Christ. So when we get in... Not even know scripture. Like you said earlier, brother, you know, uh, law and the prophets are up until John. Yeah. Yep. yep. Matthew eleven thirteen. But see, they have to eliminate that because these idiots believe that the uh, gospel of the kingdom is what we're preaching today. Yeah. Literally. You know? Yeah. Because uh, Matthew chapter 24 says the gospel, this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached, you know, in all nations or whatever, you know? Yeah. So they have to make the gospel we preach today the gospel of the kingdom. <laughs> we'll continue. And of course, you un understand the underlying, the undertone of that whole thing. What do the Catholics believe? They believe in this, the the uh, temporal and the spiritual, that they control both. They believe that they should rule the kingdoms of this earth. So, again, mm -hmm. they're showing their papist, you know, system that they're actually part of. They believe in bringing in the kingdom, the righteous government that will put, you know, sodomites and, and adulterers to death. Yeah. That's what these idiots are. The New Testament books of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, most of those books are actually still, according to them, under the dispensation of the law. But of course, you know, they the Jews really messed that one up. Because you know how that one ends? They accidentally crucify the Savior. So every time that God is giving us a test, we fail and we mess up. So then God has to basically bring judgment and then he <laughs> What's that goon walking there? <laughs> <laughs> you know, you can just tell he's one of his his little cronies or something like that. Walk past me for this film shot. You know, we want to make it look like it's random. Secret service. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and, you know, and again, they're, they're getting offended that, that man fails over and over again. See the little self-righteous undertone coming there? Yep. Don't That's repent true. of sin. You turn from your unbelief to belief. It's it's uh, intellectual decisionism, you know? Yeah. They can they offend it. What were you saying? I was just saying that's the same thing Finney preached. Yep. Let's continue. Starts over with a new dispensation. I and mean, literally, this is what dispensations believe. They believe that God takes the Jews because they crucified Christ, and he puts them on a timeout. He, God tells the Jews, go to your room, you know? And he basically just temporarily deals with the Gentiles because he's mad at the Jews for, you know, killing his son. <laughs> okay, let's look at the scriptures again. Go ahead. I'll let you do it. Romans chapter 11. I was just going to go there. <laughs> yep. Uh, verse, 11, verse 7. What then? Israel hath not obtained that which he seeketh for, but the election hath obtained it, and the rest were blinded. According as it is written, God hath given them the spirit of slumber, eyes that they should not see, and ears that they should not hear unto this day. You know, and we're not going to go through all the verses, but, you know, it's verse 11 there. I say then, have they stumbled that they should fall? God forbid. But rather through their fall, salvation has come unto the Gentiles for to provoke them to jealousy. Mm -hmm. well, if God's done with them, then why is he trying to provoke them to jealousy? Yep. That doesn't make any sense. And of course, you know, it goes down through and says when the, the uh, you know, now if the fall of them be the riches of the world and the diminishing of them, the riches of the Gentiles, how much more their fullness. There's a plan coming up for them in the future. When the times mm -hmm. of the Gentiles are completed, then, you know, it's going to come back. You know, the God's going to be, he's not done with Israel. So, yeah. I get mad again. He's like, ah, oh, man, you guys keep messing this up. But here's the problem with the church age. You and I, we're going to mess that one up too. And that one's going to end, you know, all messed up. It's going to be so bad. God's going to have to rapture us out of here. Uh, yeah, that's okay. what the Bible teaches. Go ahead, brother. Yeah, I mean, I was just going to say, you know, what about the prophecies about the great, the falling away? Not great falling away, I'm sorry. The falling away, you know. Uh, perilous times shall come. You know, men shall be lovers of their own selves, you know, whatever. Uh, they will give heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. Yeah, man's been a consistent failure over and over again. Why do you think the time of the Gentiles will be fulfilled? Because yeah. at the end of that, 
the Gentiles are going to be cut off and God's going to go back dealing with the nation of Israel again. Yep. I mean, it's clear as day. Yep. Yeah. You know, what about salvation? You know, um, we're all failures. We're all dogs. We're all wicked. We all deserve hell. That's why we accept Jesus Christ as our savior. Yep. Mm -hmm. Can't save ourselves. Unless you're part of the new IFB, apparently. <laughs> right? He's going to have to send down his tribulation, which they confuse with the wrath of God. But then at least when he gets us out of here, he can go back to his favorites, the Jews. But really, the God of the Jews is a failing God. Because he just doesn't know how to deal with man. So he tries one thing, and that doesn't work. He tries another thing, and that doesn't work. He's There's a lot of subtle attacks on God. Yeah. He's a blasphemer. That's the whole thing. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, he, he talks about God being a uh, failing and stuff, but it's man being the failure. I mean, flat out. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Exactly. I mean, they're living proof of of the prophecies, you know, spoken out by Paul. You know. Anyway, go ahead. Is this declaring the end from the beginning? And from ancient times, the things that are not yet done, saying, My counsel shall stand, and I will do all my pleasure. God declares the end from the beginning. And our God is not confused. He has a plan, and he's been working his plan from the beginning. He doesn't have to start over and try a new thing. Look, our God was... Uh, okay, well, so now you're a Calvinist? You know? Everything's predestinated, preordained. Nobody has any free will, apparently. You know, isn't that interesting? Not surprised that Adam and Eve ate of the uh, ate of the tree. Our God was not just taken aback when the Jews crucified Christ. Our God declared the end from the beginning. The Bible says he, he had, a, the he the had beginning. a process. He knew what was going to happen. He's not trying one thing and that it works, and then he tries another thing and that it works. No, you know what? Our God has had a plan from the beginning. Reminds me of uh, WrestleMania or Royal Rumble or something like that. It does. Yeah. <laughs> it really does. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Anyways, I, I could say some more stuff there, but I'll just let that go. Dispensationalism <laughs> <laughs> is the catalyst in which the Zionism stuff comes out, the free trip stuff comes out. This is uh, dispensationalism is like their key to somehow unlocking their doctrines. <laughs> to say that the world is in a state of shock this morning would be to understate the situation. The event seems to have taken place at the same time all over the world just about 25 minutes ago. Jumbo jets plummet to earth as they no longer have a pilot at the control. Driverless buses and trains and subways and cars cause unimaginable disaster. Uh, no, actually, I don't think it's going to be that many people that go up. So don't worry about it. It'll be just a few people going up at the catching up. Time goes by that that's becoming more apparent. But we'll continue. Because when you look at First Corinthians chapter 15, it shows that the pre-tribulation rapture was never taught before. It was a mystery until the apostle Paul. I've been studying the Bible for 50 years. I can't come up with a single verse anywhere in the Bible that teaches a pre-tribulation rapture. Can you help me with that? Will you, will you tell me where the Bible teaches that? Yep. <laughs> yeah, that's R.C. Sproul, the guy in the uh, blue shirt. He wrote his own Bible. He's a heretic. You know, but see, when you're desperate, when you're a de desperate papist, you have to throw anybody you can into your little documentary to prove your point. Yeah. Yeah, it's funny they say you can't give one verse, but yet they can't give one verse for the post trib rapture either. Yeah. So. Yeah. Yeah, that's not true, brother, because it says after the tribulation in Matthew twenty four. <laughs> after the tribulation. Oh, oh. But it's still not one verse there, numbskull, because it's three verses. Yeah. So I always leave out of those days, but uh, that's yeah. a story. <laughs> There are, there's this argument by post trivers that uh, the preacher rapture was ne never taught until Darby. Now, this comes as a surprise and a disturbing shock 
to many who advocate this view is when they discover that no one in the history of the church had ever articulated in its full orbed form until the middle of the 19th century. The man by the name of John Nelson Darby associated with the Plymouth Brethren movement who first uh, defended and ar articulated this particular perspective. Here's the uh -huh. problem. They might say, well, why wasn't this taught then for a long time? Well, here's the thing. This is very easy. If you know your history about the Catholic Church, what happened? That's why it's called Dark Ages. The scriptures were locked up in monasteries. All they knew was Catholic doctrine. You see that? So, look, you have to give them a break. If this goes on for centuries without studying the Bible, right doctrine would be lost during that time, see? You mean to tell me that the Lord Jesus Christ came down to the earth, lived a sinless life, died on the cross, was buried, established the local New Testament church, men like Paul and Peter... Established the what? What? The local New Testament church? Chapter and verse? Yeah. It's right there in the New Testament, brother. Come on. <laughs> sure. Oh, yeah, yeah. You know, the church referring to the body. You know? Yeah, you know, they're getting membership cards and everything. Yeah, yeah. 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 Hello, my name is Jeremy. I'm, I'm part of the body of Christ local church. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> you have your name tag sticker, Jeremy? <laughs> uh, no, I left it today. I'm sorry, but I do have this shirt that says I'm a sarcastic. I'm sarcastic, so yeah. <laughs> All right. Gave us the writings, the structure for this movement called the local New Testament Church, and then we missed out on the key doctrine for 1,800 years. They were so arrogant as to believe that they had knowledge that God didn't even give the apostles. You know, until John Nelson Darby <laughs> came on the scene, no understand scripture, understand doctrine. Everybody had it all wrong. So John Nelson Darby came. I mean, does that really make sense to anybody? Uh, uh, so who was it that had it right? Uh, the Catholics? <laughs> all those centuries? Hmm. Kind of interesting there. You know, the good old verse of scripture here real quickly about this thing of, you know, it's, it's sealing it up for, you know, 1,800 years and things. Well, uh, Daniel chapter 11. Now, let me minimize this so I get the Bible thing up. Um, Daniel chapter 11. It's just, it's just heresy to say these things. Or, excuse me, chapter 12. <laughs> you know, that it's sealed up and things. Okay, well, how about verse 9 here? And he said, Go thy way, Daniel, for the words are closed up and sealed till the time of the end. Many shall be purified and made white and tried, but the wicked shall do wickedly, and none of the wicked shall understand, uh, but the wise shall understand. None of the wicked shall understand. Yeah. yeah. Not a problem. Well, prior to 1830, no one knew about these, these doctrines. No one, no one talked about the imminent return of Christ. No one talked about a pre-tribulation rapture. Uh, no one in the Catholic Church. That is true. He believed that the Church of England had lost any notion of salvation by grace. And that it had forsaken biblical ideas of what church should be. For Darby, it was time to start afresh with a new church and prepare Jesus' imminent second coming. They teach that the rapture happens before the tribulation. We believe that the rapture happens after the tribulation. You say, why? Do we believe that? Because that's what the Bible says. Really? <laughs> Schofield comes back with a contract to publish John Nelson Darby's Zionist notes. The Zionist Jews infiltrated the Christian church in the early 1900s through Cyrus Schofield. He was their little puppet. They introduced Zionist propaganda into the churches by publishing Darby's notes in a Bible. So they defiled the Holy Bible. They defiled it. <laughs> so dispensationalists are distorting and they're perverting the immutability of God. They seek to change that which God has not changed. They also try to keep the same that which God has already changed. A prime example of that is this matter of the Jews. And this is the heresy of Zionism, the worship of the Jews. Who has more Nobel? Worship. Anybody else? 
the Jew. <laughs> Maybe that has something to do with why they're mad at the Jew. Maybe it's because they are smart. Well, was his name Einstein? We obviously understand from the Bible that the Jews were God's chosen people in the Old Testament. But the Bible says that when Jesus Christ came, he came into his own and his own received him not. And the Bible tells us that the kingdom of God was taken from them and given to a nation, bring forth the fruits thereof. He said, you've got the cover. Now, he has never taken that covenant from Israel. Anybody that says he has, they better watch themselves because they're lying. They might lose their everlasting life. They just may lose their, their, their salvation. You say, you don't think they can lose their salvation. Well, maybe they can. Look at Hebrews chapter number 8, verse number 6. But now hath he obtained a more excellent ministry, but how much also he is the mediator of a better covenant, which was established upon better promises. So if that first covenant had been faultless, then should no place have been sought for the second. Okay, we're not in the new covenant. Right? No. The new covenant has not come yet. No, these people are stupid. They are. I mean, they, they'll 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 say the new covenant is Jesus Christ dying on the cross in New Testament. You know, whatever. Yep, that's their new covenant. Yeah, which is funny because a lot of the new versions actually put that into the text. They take out testament right. and they put in covenant. Yep. Yeah, you're right about that. Yep. Continue. Yeah, go ahead. For finding fault with them, he saith, Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day when I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt, because they continue not in my covenant, and I regard them not, saith the Lord. So according to the Bible in the New Testament, God does not regard the Jews. God does not regard the physical nation of Israel as being his people. Because here's what they teach. They'll say, oh, no, no, ah, the promise was really? made to Abraham and his seed. So see, it's all the descendants of Abraham. That land belongs to all the descendants, all the physical descendants of Abraham. And God said, in your seed, forever that land over there in Palestine will be yours. And you know, the Jews were in that land for several thousand years, and in 1948, they got their land back. So, oh, we got to give the land back to the Jews. You know what? No. We will give the land back to the Lord Jesus Christ. It's called the millennial reign. When we preach against the Jews, please understand this. You know, here's what we believe about the Jews. We believe that they're people like anybody else. And Judaism is a false religion like any other false religion. So, oh, do you guys hate the Jews? No, you know what? The Jews need to get saved. The Jews need to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ like anyone else. But they don't get a free path because they were born Jewish. You don't get this free pass where like, oh, well, you know, God is. Okay. God All right. I already see what this numbskull is doing here. Uh, he's basically saying that anybody that practiced Judaism is a Jew. You know, and it's just typical work of these uh, people like this. I've, I've done a lot of research in this whole anti-Zionism, Jew world order, whatever you want to call it. Mm -hmm. Garbage. Every one of them that, that when, they, when they reference Jews, they're talking about Judaism, people that practice Judaism. And that's not what a Jew is. Sorry. Yeah. Okay. Jesus even rebuked people that were false Jews and called them the synagogue of Satan. So anybody that's a true Jew is a true Israelite. You know, had God cast away his people, God forbid, for I am also an Israelite of the seed of Abraham and of the tribe of Benjamin. Romans 11, 1. Anyway, just want yeah. to make that point. Yeah, Stephen Anderson came out with a video many years ago where he said that there's not one mention of uh, physical Jews in the entire New Testament after Jesus, you know, rose from the dead or whatever. And I quoted the thing of, you know, what you just said, brother, about Paul in Romans chapter 11, verse one, he talks about that he's a, you know, a physical Jew, you know, yeah. God cast away his people. So yeah, these, again, they don't know what they're talking about. Lying again. But the Jew, I mean, the Jew is, no, you know what? The Jew is a heathen unbeliever like everyone else. You say, who are the uh, Not true. God has a special covenant with them that's just going to come in the future, and God's not cast them away. The, right. we're supposed to bless the Jews, and we're supposed to bless Abraham's seed, and we're supposed to protect Abraham's seed, and we're supposed to bless them that we might be blessed. But then, then bless me. So pray for the Jews. Pray for Israel. Bless Abraham's seed. If you want to bless Abraham's seed, bless me. You say, oh, I thought, I thought the whole Bible was about the Jews. No, here's what you understand. I got to say this again. 
Um, so in other words, the only Jews are, are Christians, according to these idiots. So uh, where does the Bible say that you become a Jew when you get saved? You know, you're, you're not a Jew as a lost person, but then you get saved and you become a Jew. You know, uh, how does that work? You, know, you take on the, the some kind of physical thing. Now you're a physical Jew. You know, it, idiots. And, you yeah, know, but, go ahead. I was just going to say, you get guys like Adam Fannin and Tyler Baker that were part of this movement, and then they get kicked out and they're heretics. Did they lo lose their Jewishness? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, and, you know, um, I mean, we've, uh, I mean, these scriptures have been gone over so many, many times, but just to go over them again, you know, it's as simple as, you know, Romans chapter 11 just makes it all so simple for, um, for I would not, brethren, that you should be ignorant of this mystery, beginning in verse 25. For I would not, brethren, that you should be ignorant of this mystery, lest you should be wise in your own conceits, that blindness in part has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles be come in. And, and so all Israel shall be saved, as it is written, there shall come out of Sion the deliverer, and shall turn away ungodliness from Jacob. For this is my covenant unto them when I will take when I shall take away their sins. As concerning the gospel, they are enemies for your sakes, but as touching the election, they are beloved for the Father's sakes. I mean, you <laughs> you can't get any more clear than that. These devils, they cannot handle that verse. I mean, they all just skip Romans eleven and act like it doesn't exist. And their favorite verse they run to is Romans chapter two, um, toward the end of the chapter. I see this one a lot with a lot of the uh you know, replacement theology type, you know, it says uh, for in verse 28, for he is not a Jew, which is out in, which is one outwardly, neither is that circumcision, which is outward in the flesh, but he is a Jew, which is one inwardly and circumcision that is of the heart and the spirit and not their praise, not of man, but of God. See, they use that and they run with that. That's what they use. But then if you go on to come, huh? Oh, go ahead. No, I was just agreeing with you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Romans chapter three verse one says, "What advantage had the Jew, or what profit is there of circumcision?" You know, <laughs> you know they don't keep reading. Yeah. All right, we'll continue. The whole Bible is about Jesus Christ, <laughs> but the anointing which ye have received of Him abideth in you. That's the Holy Spirit, and ye need not that any man teach you. But as the same anointing teacheth you of all things, and is true, and is no lie, and even as it hath taught you, ye shall abide in him. It must be meant as you know, you've gone through all this dispensational stuff, and you've taught us about it. What do you want us to take away from, from these teachings? Here's what I want you to take away from it. That ye need not that any man teach you. Okay, then we don't need you. Or Stephen Anderson. Or, you know, Abdul Mahia, you know? I was just, at, I have that in my notes for this part, too. Yeah, then leave those IF, IFB churches. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Like, get out of there. I mean, I'm surprised nobody just got up and walked out when he said that. <laughs> <laughs> yep. You know, and yet they would call us heretics because we're not part of a local New Testament church. Oh. <laughs> it's funny. And we don't believe on the Trinity either. <laughs> yeah. Oh no! Oh no! You can't have that. You know, you need to believe that Catholic Trinity. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Continue. We need to reject this sensation. We need to make sure that we go back to the Word of God. We need to make sure that we're people that is emphasizing the Bible and only the Bible. You need, you know, we need a generation to rise up to say, "I reject all commentaries. I reject Clarence Larkin. I reject Peter Ruckman, and I'm just going to go to." The Bible, you know, okay. I don't, I, I, if I don't read C.I. Schofield's notes, if I don't read uh, Clarence Larkin's books, if I don't uh, have these men teach me about dispensational theology, I won't understand scripture. That's not true. I have confidence that the Holy Spirit resides within me and he can lead me into all truths. He can teach me all things whatsoever I need to learn. I can have confidence that this commentator can comment on these 66 different books. The Holy Spirit is sufficient to teach me these biblical truths. I don't need dispensationalism. In fact, if you have to. Uh, I'm going to take a break here for just a second. You know, <laughs> just it sounds like a bunch of little brats that never were taught to, you know, 
go sit in the corner or get a spanking or something like that. I just throw in little fits and they get away with it or something, you know, what it reminds me of. I know. Yeah. Their pulpits are like their punching bags. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. That's not true. <laughs> <laughs> I don't, I don't know how uh, a red-blooded man can sit in the congregation of any of these guys. Yeah, yeah, they're all sissies. Yeah, but uh, you know the the whole thing is, if you remember, you know the, the Holy Spirit's always been there to lead people into the truth. Oh, uh, there again, a little dispensational problem because you have in the you know early part of the Book of Acts, you have the Jews coming and they've heard only of the baptism of John, and and you know they're asked, you know, do you believe? Have you received the Holy Spirit? And they say, we don't even know if there is a Holy Spirit. You know, and the Holy Spirit's, you know, being imparted to people in the early part of the book of Acts. You know, so the transitional nature of Acts, they, they don't deal with that. So, yeah. Yeah. Like in, uh, I think it's Acts chapter 13, where it says, uh, uh, it talks about, you know, John baptized by water, but now you should be baptized with the Holy Spirit. You know? Yeah. Yeah. Yep. All right. Well, you go. Okay. Have them teach you. You'll be confused and go into heresy because you know all there's a dread thing is heresy. You say, can I understand the Bible all on my own? Yes, you can. If you're saved, the Holy Spirit will guide you. The Holy Spirit will teach you. You need not that any man teach you, but the same anointing teaches you of all things. We need a revival in this country of Christians who are going back simply to the Word of God. What do we say when we go back to the Word of God? We're having confidence that the Holy Spirit will reside within us and teach us. So don't fall into this trap where people want to act like they're smarter than you and act like they've got all this insight, they got all these doctrines, and you need that. You need that moment. You need a moment. All you need is the Lord Jesus Christ. All you need is the Holy Spirit. All you need is the kingdom of Bible. And you can understand the word of God on your own. The Bible says in First Corinthians chapter 2 and verse number 9, but as it is written, I have not seen nor ear heard neither have entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for them that love him. You know, the Bible tells us that there's a lot of safe people out there who their eyes aren't seeing, their ears, they're not hearing. The word of God is not entering into their hearts. They don't see what God has prepared for them. Uh, but, but look what it goes on. Okay, uh, Muhammad, that verse is not talking about the word of God. It's talking about heaven. You stupid idiot. Yeah. No, but I also want to also want to comment on the just this whole thing against you know learning off other brethren. It's just so it's so ridiculous, you know. Yeah. Uh, second yeah. <laughs> Second Timothy two and verse two, and the things that thou hast heard of me among many witnesses, the same commit thou to faithful men who shall be able to teach others also. There is nothing wrong with learning off other brethren and bouncing things back and forth and reading the scriptures and learning things off of each other. I mean, that's, that's part of being the church and stuff. If we were all supposed to sit here and privately interpret everything, we'd be all having these different conclusions. You're no better than a, a Babel building with all the different versions saying, what do you got this verse? Uh, uh, I, I think it says here, spiritually speaking, blah, blah, blah. And you just have a Babel, you know, I mean, <laughs> It just, I, I, I can't stand when I hear them talk like that. You have no, no need any, any man teach you, but sit here in my church while I sit in this pulpit and scream at you. Yeah, exactly. And if you leave, we'll call you a lost heretic. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Continuing. Say, but God has revealed them unto us by the Spirit. For the Spirit searches all things, they do things of God. You see, we need a revival again of going back to the book. No longer going to Clarence Larkin and these charts. Not going to Peter Ruffman and John Nelson Darby, C.I. Schofield's reference Bible. No, we need to go back to the actual Word of God, the King James Bible, and understand that the Holy Spirit can teach us all things. He can lead us into all truth and ask the Lord, open thou mine eyes that I may behold wondrous things out of thy law. We need to go back to studying to show ourselves approved unto God. A workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Yeah. You don't divide. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <clears throat> so, anyways, then they get into Anderson's little uh, salvation message or whatever here. 
in uh, Guyana, actually, in the public school down there. And, um, you know, we'll be bringing some stuff out on that. But I'd say that's about enough of that. Oh, those poor children. Yep. And he actually says about at one point in time in this thing, I watched it, and he said about uh, sin is, is disobeying your parents, disobeying your teachers. He actually says oh. that. Uh, yeah. I thought uh, disobeying your teachers is a sin. That's kind of interesting. Yeah. So, all right. <laughs> I really thought they were going to come have their guns loaded, but really I was more ready to go to sleep than anything. <laughs> <laughs> that was so bad. I mean, that really was. That was about as bad as that Seventh-day Adventist video I seen a couple weeks ago. Yeah, I watched it, and there was just a lot of grunting on my part. Uh E, uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. <clears throat> Good night. The comments are flying. Yeah. yeah, they are. Yeah, they've been flying. I haven't been able to watch them because I had the other screen up there. But, um, anyhow, I guess we can do some questions now. Yeah. If they slow down enough. <laughs> First question. I'm 21. Do I have to get a wife? No, you don't. Okay. No. Paul even invited. You know, the Apostle Paul invited. So you don't have to get a wife. Uh, uh, and let me say this. You know, women don't have that freedom like a man does. So I just want to make that point. Yep. Says Brian, how many different covenants are in the Bible? Uh, can't think off the top of my head. Um, I I know. Yeah, I I'd, I'd have to answer that another way. Coming in. My son's coming in, so <laughs> he knows more about the Bible and, and everything than these uh, Baphics that we were watching there. <laughs> okay. You gonna play over there or what? <laughs> so there what's the number of events after the catching away for me to look forward to well i mean the only thing you really need to look for now is the, is the catching away itself or i mean you know we're not going to be here for the uh events after after the fact so we're not going to see any of them on the earth all right i'm going to take a break here for just a minute i'll be back in a little bit i gotta put him to bed okay okay that's fine I'll, I'll do I'll do the questions for now. Yeah. Is it a sin to take sleeping pills? Well, it depends on what you mean by sleeping pills. You know, I'm not for uh, taking any kind of you know pharmacia anything like that you know any of that junk but like you know there is uh herbal supplements and stuff you can take for sleeping definitely yeah you're better um, off drinking like so maybe if you're if you're into it some nice like uh like before bed tea that they make that's good stuff um please forgive my ignorance but i'm curious where did people that died go before the Abrahamic covenant period. Well, you talking about, uh, during the pre flood world in during the time of Abraham. Well, if they died and they didn't, and they didn't, uh, they weren't after, they didn't have God. Well, they went to hell. And if they, uh, did have God, they went to Abraham's bosom. Okay. It's called in the old Testament. It's called paradise. You can read about Abraham's bosom in Luke chapter 16. And then um, uh, autism enlightenment. What's the stance of medical marijuana? Stay away from it. Um, part of my testimony that I was really heavily into that stuff and a lot of other um, drugs when I was lost. And the fact of the matter is you can't justify marijuana. I'm sorry, but if you're mm -hmm. in the kind where you smoke it and stuff, it's still affecting your brain and making you high. And no matter what you want to say and believe, it's sin. So you're altering your mind. No, stay away from marijuana. If, you, if there's some sort of like... Uh, 
because I've read about those the hemp pills that actually don't make you high. I'm not 100% sure if that's right, but if it doesn't have the high to it, it gives you like some sort of just decent bodily feelings, can completely organic. I'd say that's probably okay, but stay away from marijuana, 100%. Well, you guys exposed Gino. Who's Gino? Gino, who, uh, what's, who's, who's Gino? I have no idea. I've never heard of that person. Question. Will animals be sacrificed in the temple during the 1,000 year millennial kingdom? Uh, I do know that there is burnt offerings in the Millennial Kingdom. Um, if I can pull up the verse here. Let's see here. I'm trying to remember where that exact verse is. Um, let's see here. You know where the verse is? I'm trying to remember where it is. Wait, what are you looking for, Jeremy? I'm, I think I'm answering something. Uh, the, burnt, the burnt offering offerings in the Millennial Kingdom. I have it in my notes. I thought I did anyway. I'm pretty sure it's somewhere in Zechariah. I'm pretty sure in Zechariah it talks about the Gentile nations coming up to um, offer sacrifice and honor the Lord. Yeah, there are sacrifices in the Millennial Kingdom, absolutely. Yep. To you, to, to you guys are Old Testament saints in heaven, and I've heard Bill Grady that they will be judged at the Great White Throne Judgment. No. Um, if they are, uh, if they were in the Old Testament, they're an Old Testament saint, they're in heaven now, okay? Because Jesus Christ went down to Abraham's bosom and led, he led the Old Testament saints out, and now they're in heaven because the perfect sacrifice was completed when Jesus Christ died on the cross. So, no. They're already in heaven. Their judgment's done. They don't want to worry about that. Yeah. And, um, yeah. No, Gino, they, Gino Jennings, that's the guy. Okay, I'll look into him, uh, Florida Gospel Tracks. I'll, I'll look into him this week. And, uh, yeah, Busy said that somebody asked a while ago if someone can explain First John 5.10, and, I mean, that's, that's pretty simple. He that believeth on the Son of, of God hath the witness in himself. He that believeth not God hath made him a liar, because he believeth not the record that God gave of his Son. Uh, meaning, he that believeth on the Son of God hath the witness in himself. That's basically a reference to the fact that the Holy Spirit is inside of you when you're saved. And that's one of the things, you know, when you're saved, you do feel alive. Your eyes feel, you're, you are, your eyes are open. You actually see the world for what it really is. You know, it's a complete turnaround from when you were lost. And the basically, if uh, if you don't believe the record God gave of his son, the Holy Word, uh, the King James Bible, then, I mean, you're you're lost. Simple as that. This is a record that was written for people to get saved years and years and years after the Lord was crucified. I heard a testimony of someone who said Jesus Christ came to her and talked to her directly, and this is how she was saved. Do you think Jesus Christ directly talks to people? If someone says that, they're flat out lost and they're lying to you. Okay, Jesus Christ has not come to anybody physically today. Okay, um, and whenever you read it, whenever you read in the Bible where people saw Jesus Christ personally, like not in the flesh, but I'm talking about when he was in his glorified body. Look at Daniel, Daniel chapter ten. He came to Daniel. What happened? Daniel fell down dead before him. So did Paul. So did John in the uh, book of Revelation chapter 1. So when everybody says that Jesus Christ came to them, ask them, did they fall down dead before him? Let's see what their answer is. Or, you know, Most of the time they'll say, well, no, they'll, they'll never mention that. But the thing is, no, Jesus Christ is not physically taught to anybody today. Jesus Christ talks to us through his word. Okay. That that whole that whole stuff comes from the charismatic, you know, the charismatic church. And um, yeah, I see here, uh, uh, Road FFM. Some say the dead are sleeping till the judgment day. Some say they already in heaven or hell. Where are they? They're in. They're either in heaven or, or hell, because um, the whole reference to sleep is a reference to death in the old New Testaments, and um, 
basically the way the way hell works is is when someone dies and they're lost they go straight to hell and they're already burning and being tormented and at the end of, millenn of the millennial kingdoms at the, at the end of the millennial kingdom god is going to bring them back out of hell he's going to judge them and then they're going to be cast into the lake of fire so i've actually described it several times is basically the most horrific roller coaster ride you'll ever have you're going down and then you come back up for judgment and then you're back down the lake of fire i mean you want to talk about horrifying you know if you're if you're lost out there get saved because you don't want to you don't have to face that question when it says grace through faith does it mean more than just believing uh yes and no okay i'll answer that very easily B grace is god's mercy okay and god offers offers us a free gift Okay, you can't just go and say, oh, I believe, and that's it, you know. No, you have to come to the end of yourself. And God gives you that free gift when you come to the end of yourself and you admit the fact that you're a sinner. You know, that's not works. You realize that, you know, you're, you have to realize you're lost before you can be saved, okay? So that's what grace through faith is. You, uh, you come to the end of yourself, you realize you're a sinner, you're no good, you can't save yourself, you deserve hell, you call upon the name of the Lord to be saved. It's that simple. Grace through faith. That's what that is. And then uh, John Mayfield, are you saved if you believe in the Trinity? Well, there's plenty of people that I would say are misled by the Trinity, and they, I would, I would say that they're saved. But if you start to study it out and you realize what the Trinity actually is, that it's that it does teach three three separate gods, you can't make it into one. Then you're gonna have to come away from it because there's only one God. And also, I've I've uh, talked about this before. Uh, Jews cannot a lot of Jews refuse to get saved because they can't believe in the Trinity. They reject the Trinity altogether and uh, Catholics will tell them well you have to believe in the Trinity so they refuse to get saved because they believe in one Lord. So yeah you I mean if you believe the Trinity you're not going to believe it for long if you're really saved. Yep, I would agree with that. I saw a question here um, one verse top of your head uh, one verse that proves the preacher of rapture. Um, well, can't really say one verse but um, Ephesians chapter 1 uh, verse 12 start there that we should be to the praise of his glory who first trusted in Christ you're saved in other words in whom he also trusted after that he heard the word of truth the gospel of your salvation in whom also after that you believed you were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise no sealed Christian can be in the time of Jacob's trouble it's not possible because you would if you take the mark you'd have a real problem you know because uh, then the Lord says, you know, if any man takes the mark, he, you know, basically goes to hell. Uh, so what do you do with that? I mean, it's a problem. But verse 14 says, which is the earnest of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession under the praise of his glory. Um, the catching up is the redemption of the purchased possession. You have to understand that, you know, the Lord catches up those that are saved because he purchased us with his own blood, according to Acts chapter 20, verse 28. Yeah, amen. Exactly. Henry Henry asked if we had a Facebook. Uh, me and Tim do, and we actually have a group of believers on there, a small group that we talk with each other almost every day or every other day. So um, my Facebook is on my YouTube channel. If you want to go there, I have a direct link to it. Um, you can add me there. Yeah, on my YouTube channel, I have a, a link to my uh, my Facebook page for AVBTM. And then if uh, if you want my personal page, just go on there, uh, send me a message and stuff, and I'll uh, see about adding you. I hate Facebook, so there's my answer. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. Yeah, I know a lot of people do, but, you know, it's the only way I can really communicate with people. If they get to the point where they start asking all kinds of personal information, then it'd be bye bye Facebook. Yeah. Isaiah, what is the Torah? The Torah is the name for uh, the Old Testament of the Bible. That's what uh, the Jews mainly call it. Torah. First, first five books. Yeah, first, yeah, first five. Yeah. It's also yeah. called the Pentateuch. So. Mm -hmm. Do you think that Ezekiel 128 or Paul's experience on the road to Damascus can happen today? No, because we have a perfect Bible. You know, we're, we're not going to have uh, experiences or anything like that today. But I do believe some of these experiences are going to come back in the time of Jacob's trouble because it'll be for the Jews and the Jews require a sign. That's what those 
whole experiences are. Uh, a lot of that stuff, you know, you see all these people that say, oh, I've seen Jesus Christ dream or a vision. A lot of that stuff's charismatic junk. Okay. You do well to stay away from all that stuff. And um, autism enlightenment. I asked Christ to take over my life, but that was a few weeks ago. I feel more confused, if anything, now. Well, if you truly repented and put your put your faith in the Lord, you called him and everything. Um, the fact that you're even like this right now, and you're you're worried and you're and you're looking and seeking. I mean, most lost people will make a profession of faith and never take any second thought to it. But the people I've noticed that are truly saved will actually sit there and have a concern and want to get it figured out as quickly as possible. So I don't know for sure how your testimony is, but it sounds to me like you are saved. You're just trying to get assurance. Um, KJB Soldier says or asks, can a man forfeit his salvation? Will he walk away from salvation? Can a person do that? Well, first of all, number one, no. Uh, they can't lose their salvation for any reason. Let me see here. Second Timothy chapter 2, uh, verse 13 says, If we believe not, yet he abideth faithful, he cannot deny himself. Means he can't deny his own body. So, uh, and you're part of the body of Christ when you're saved. Number two, why would you want to if you're truly saved? Why would you walk away? It wouldn't make any sense. If somebody just got up one day and just truly walked away from everything that God has revealed to them and shown them and blessed and given them, why would you walk away from that? You know, I just that don't make any sense to me. So no, I don't believe either one, really. You know. Mm -hmm. Um, Adam Moore asked, uh, "What is the opening question you would ask somebody if you're going to witness to them?" Um, I I actually a lot of times will will get into witnessing with people. Um, in it'll come up in conversation. I don't actually just you know, walk up to somebody. I mean, I've done that. I used to do that with the door to door thing. And we're just out here in the neighborhood today to ask you if you died today, do you know for sure you would go to heaven when you die? And, you know, it kind of, it, it instantly kind of makes them say, okay, great. This guy's trying to get me into his church. It, you know, yeah. you know, kind of leads the direction the wrong way. Whereas if I talk to somebody about the Lord, it'll usually come up in the conversation. I, you know, the Lord will open up a door of witnessing. I've seen that thing so many times. I've tried to witness to people at times and it just falls apart. And, you know, and I just, I, you know, if the Lord's in it, he's going to make it happen. Um, there's loads the one time and uh, I have my bumper magnets on the back of my truck. And this guy, you know, I went out, I'm loading lumber in the back of my truck. And one of the employees comes walking over to me and he says, Hey, let me help you. And I thought, okay. So he comes walking over, we're loading boards in and he's being quiet. And he stops and he says, are you a Christian? You know, and points to the back of my vehicle. And I said, yeah. And we got into a, a big conversation about the Lord, you know, and, and a witness to him got a real good chance to witness. So I, I usually when it comes to witnessing, I just I let the Lord lead in that thing. And, um, you know, he'll just getting into a conversation with somebody about whatever and then just praying you know, silently and, and saying, Lord, okay, if you want me to witness to this guy, open the door, you know, that's the way I do it. Yeah, I agree with that for sure. I don't believe in pushy evangelism. Yeah. You know, and, um, and I, I will say this, the whole pushy evangelism thing, the, the little thing that you do, the little, if you died today, do you know for sure? When you do that, uh, I did that, you know, many, many, many times. Or, you know, going door to door. I can't tell you how many times I, you know, went through that whole line with people and the whole thing. And never, never did I see anybody get saved from that. Genuinely born again. Never. Right. Right. Absolutely. Do you believe the Lord wants us true Bible believing Christians to go into church buildings to help lukewarm Christians? <laughs> I would say no. <laughs> Not on your life. Um, you know, you, you got to understand. Dan, you still have a uh, you still have sinful flesh, and you can fall as well. You know, don't think for two seconds that you're you know above these people or above all that, and think that you can't slip up and get caught up into the uh, the crowd because you can. So just you gotta be careful with that whole thing. That's why it's important to withdraw yourself from wicked people. Mm -hmm. 
Yep. And at what point in time do you tell that person that church buildings are unscriptural? Yeah. You know, it doesn't make any sense. Yeah. Um, all right. We had a uh, someone ask a question just a little while ago. Okay, yeah, here it is right here. Uh, KJV Believer, what do you guys think about Luke 16 and the unjust steward making friends of unrighteous mammon that ends up helping them? Luke chapter 16, verses 9 to 13. All right, let me pull up the verse reference. Yeah. Uh, while you guys are looking that up, let me just answer another question here real quickly. Uh, there's an Ahab that says, why was God sorry he had made man if he's all-knowing and knew how wicked man would become? I hope I don't come off as an atheist because of this question. Um, no, it's a fair question, but uh, you have to understand free will. God gives man a free will. Um, you know, that doesn't mean that he's, you know, if, if I take my son and I say, uh, you can do whatever you want this morning and my son goes out of his own free will and gets some canned goods or whatever or some food out of the refrigerator to help me make breakfast that's great if he goes and gets some candy or something we don't have candy but you know if he goes and gets something that he shouldn't be eating then i can be grieved by that if he disobeys me but he has a free will uh god gave man a free will he doesn't preordain and, and he, did, he didn't create you know robots yeah but anyways, go to your question there. Well, I'll say this about Luke 16. Uh, all the way up until um, all the way up until uh, 14, this is a, still a parable here. Because if you go back to Luke 15, Jesus says he makes a parable on them. You know, uh, it's a parable. It's not exactly, I guess you could say literal. It's more of like what would happen in the millennial kingdom. Most of the time when Jesus is speaking in parables, he's speaking of the millennial kingdom. Okay. Um, it says, and I say unto you, make to yourselves friends of mammon of unrighteousness, that when ye fail, that they may receive you into everlasting habitations. He that is faithful in that which is least is faithful also in much. He that is unjust in the least is unjust also in much. If therefore ye have not been faithful in the unrighteous mammon, who will commit to your trust the true riches? And if ye have not been faithful in that which is another man's, who shall give you that which is your own? You know, no ser no servant can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one or and love the other, or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. Ye cannot serve God and mammon. Okay. Yeah, that's a good question. You know, I don't really 100% sure what exactly what it's what's being said there, but it later goes on and says you can't serve money and God. At the same time, you yeah, know. I was about to say pretty much. I would say verse thirteen pretty much describes everything. Yeah, you cannot serve yeah. two masters. What was what was the question again? Originally, it was. Uh, um, let me look here. I was I was looking over at the comments and I didn't really get the question. Yeah, he said, what do you think about Luke 16 and the unjust steward making friends of unrighteous mammon that ends up helping them? Oh, okay. Yeah, I misread the, misread the question. It doesn't really say that they were being helped. Yeah. No, it doesn't say that. Yeah, no, it doesn't really say that at all. It just says that make to yourselves friends of the mammon of unrighteousness, that when ye fail, they may receive you into the into everlasting habitations. Okay, what it sounds like to me here, you're making friends of mammon of unrighteousness because you're going to fail. You're going to have everlasting habitations. You know, it sounds like they're going to hell. What it sounds like to me, you know, doesn't say anything about you know like being 
making friends of rich people or anything like that. Yeah. You it's, know, it's a parable. Go ahead. That's the thing you need to understand there. He's saying about, you know, Lord commended the, un, you know, the unjust steward there. He's talking about a lost man, you know, so right. not something that we're supposed to do. And you know, he's just saying, you know, the children of this, you know, the, uh, the children of this world are in their generation wiser than the children of light. A lot of times lost people have better sense in terms of business type of things than saved people do. Mm -hmm. You're right about that. You know, and, and I understand why, because you get kind of jumbled up with, with things and you're trying to serve the Lord. And, and sometimes you're busy with that and you can't get around to doing whatever. And as a result, you know, you're, you, you'll suffer, you know, monetarily or whatever else. And, you know, it's tricky. Yeah. And, and I want to say this too, about uh, the whole, uh, you know, parables and stuff like that. A lot of that's kind of, some of that's going to be cloudy to us because it's not our dispensation. You know, yeah. you know, like I said, that's more futuristic stuff. You know, most of the time when Jesus is speaking in parables, he's referring to the kingdom. Yeah. So, and you know, and in on that note, brother, that's a good point. Um, in in the time of Jacob's trouble, there's definitely going to be some more enduring to the end, some survival type of stuff. You know, prepping mm -hmm. whatever. They're going to have to think about some of that stuff more. So. Right. Right. Yeah, absolutely. But uh, I saw a question there on the, the thing of Black History Month. What about Black History Month? Let me just say this. Um, Black History Month is a racial thing. It's a racist type of a deal. And what what they're doing is it's the, they want to incite race wars in the future. And uh, so they'll they'll raise up something like Black History Month or black rights or whatever else to make white racists angry. And, you know, it just a Bible believing Christian says uh, the true standard for a Bible believer is, you know, God made me to be who I am and I'm I'm going to be thankful for that. And, and I want to be different culturally and embrace my own culture, you know, as a Christian. Don't ever throw you know, your beliefs as a Christian with cultural type of whatever. Um, obviously, if you're if your tribe that you come from in Africa is is into head hunting or something, you don't do that because it's your culture you know but uh you know we should be different and and thank the lord for that and um you get into some of this racist type of stuff and it's it's designed to make people angry towards each other so yeah that's it's just a lot of that stuff that's why i reject it i i hate racism it's mm, yeah stupid um, um I was just, I was just gonna say I know JT is asking this uh, question to to Brian. Um, he's uh, saying, "What are your thoughts on David Wood from Acts 17 Apologetics? He does some good stuff against Islam, but I think he preaches the kingdom of heaven." And I just want to say, yeah, JT, I, I've seen David Wood, and I'm pretty sure he went to a Jesuit school. You know, I would say this too: be careful of anybody that's teaching apologetics. You know, yeah, you know, it's. Basically, what apologetics is, you know, is just this thing where you've got to answer. You got to give an answer to every man. You got to answer everything, you know, and that's not true. And a lot of the street preachers were big on apologetics. They would go out and debate people all the time. They would always have these big debate shows, you know. Uh, that's very wicked. You're wasting your time doing that stuff. Um, yep. Okay. This Matthew guy says, I've said it before and I'll say it again a thousand times. How is being gay a choice? I get how you can choose not to act on it, but how do you how do you control your inclination? Well, let me say this. Um, being gay is a choice. All right. And, and, I'll, and, I'll, and I'll say this as well. The reason why people become gay is because they, retain, they fail to retain God in their knowledge. OK, they fail to come to the end themselves. So the more and more wicked and perverse a person gets, the more vile their mind becomes and more darkened they become. And the perversion level gets deeper. Mm -hmm. so, uh, it's God's judgment. Um, because they were, they failed to retain God in their knowledge. That's the reason for sodomites. Mm -hmm. And that's the reason for transgenderism. That's the reason for pedophilia as well. You get to so low 
so dark of perversion that uh, God just gives you over to that because you you fail to retain God in your knowledge. Yeah, that and I think that there's some stuff too with with uh, you know childhood type of things. You know, you get raised by feministic type people and they don't teach you how to be a man. You yep. know, then you start saying I'm I'm you know you get effeminate and whatever else, and you say that you're gay. Eh, no, no. You know, yeah. So you watch out for that. Uh, see. Did Baptists originally oppose Babel buildings? Did didn't they call them steeples? Steeple houses. Yes, yeah, steeple houses. Yep. Yeah, there was a uh, John Smythe in in the UK back uh, probably would have been the 1600s sometime if I remember correctly maybe 1700s. That, that's been a long time ago, so don't quote me on that. But uh, um, he actually, him and a couple other guys actually did not attend the state church, and they were they were uh, I guess arrested for it or something, and they were given the option of going to the state church church service. Or being uh, flogged and placed in, placed in the stocks, and they said, "We'll take the beating." <laughs> they wouldn't. They wouldn't step into a church building. So, it's, I have that in my uh, independent fundamental Baptist Catholicism studies. I show the story about that. Um, here's a funny one. The truth shall make you free. Says, "What have you to say, Car to Cardinal Edward P. F. One two three? For he cannot live without hearing your voice. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> I'd be. I think it, seeing his bedroom would probably be really scary. He probably has a picture of me or something, someplace, and and he listens to my voice at night or something. <laughs> I don't know. He's probably got like a stuffed voodoo doll of me or something that he sticks pins in. <laughs> <laughs> um. Orion Trent says there's a part of the Hebrew root movement that denies the deity of Christ. Well, they pretty much all do. But uh, is there any Old Testament scripture we can point to that suggests that Messiah would be God himself? Um, let's see here. You know anything off the top of your head, Brian? Because I don't have my notes in front of me. I'm looking at comments. <laughs> I missed the question. Somebody's asking if I'm Amish. I'm not Amish. What in the world? This is, you know, this is uh, this is traditional logging clothing here. This is it called a hickory shirt. These are suspenders. These are mobile front logging pants. Good night, I'm not Amish. <laughs> what was the question? I'm sorry. Oh, um, yeah, I'll read again because I don't have no But uh, let me get back up here. It says, um, oh shoot, where is it? Something about um, can we prove from the Old Testament that God would be manifest in the flesh, pretty much? Yeah, Isaiah nine six would be a good one. Yeah, that one. Yeah, yeah. Let me read it. I didn't even think of that one. Wow, I'm so dumb sometimes. Let's see. We'll, we'll let it go this time. <laughs> Like sometimes you know, you know these verses and then you just don't think of them when the moment comes. It just drives me nuts. For unto us a child is born, and unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, and the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. And the increase of his government and peace there shall be no end. Upon the throne of David, upon his kingdom, to order it and to establish it with judgment and with justice from henceforth forever and ever, the zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. Actually, I got another one for you. Now that I think about it, um, Isaiah chapter two. It shall come to pass in the last days that the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established in the top of the mountains, and he shall be exalted above the hills, and all nations shall flow onto it. And many people shall go and say, "Come ye, let us go into the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob, and he will teach us of his ways, and we will walk in his paths." For out of Zion shall go forth the law, and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. Who's that talking about there? Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ will rule and reign from Jerusalem for a thousand years. Mount Zion. 
it's funny these anti-Zionist people are, you know, will sit here and talk. They're, you know, they're trash, but yet they don't even understand Old Testament prophecies. Yeah. Yeah. That's kind of weird, you know, if God's all done with the Jews, why does he come back to, you know, Israel and rule and reign from Jerusalem? You know, head to head to Phoenix, Arizona or something. I mean, whatever. <laughs> um, oh, here's a real good question. Who are the wedding guests? Tribulation saints? Tribulation saints are Christians, but not in Christ. Uh, no, they're not called Christians. They're just called saints. Um, it's uh, the wedding guests. You read about them, you know, in Matthew 25, you know, the the wise virgins, you know, the five wise virgins, those are guests at the wedding. Um, they're not Christians in any, any shape, form, or fashion, but yeah, they will be tribulation saints. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Jews and Gentiles. Why is and also they, Go ahead. Oh, uh, no, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm done. Go ahead. Okay. Um, I ask here, why is Stephen Anderson so militant? Um, because he's part of a I believe part of a military um, covert op um, basically to make the rest of us look bad. Um, I mean, just think about something for a minute to anybody out there that would say, Oh, I don't know. Think about this. He's banned in five countries and yet he's still on YouTube. <laughs> How does that work? You know, I had a, a guy, um, Mac quickly years and years and years ago, random three thirty one was his YouTube channel. And he told me, he said, I'm sick and tired of YouTube. He said, I'm going to suicide my channel. <laughs> and he <laughs> came out with this video and he said, you know, fag a couple times and they shut his channel down. And yet Anderson can, can stand up and he can yell and he can scream and he can be covered by mainstream media and they don't shut his channel down. Yeah. Long. How is it that he can fly anywhere he wants to just like that? You know, just, all kinds of money coming in. They don't even, they have what, maybe a hundred people going to their, you know, Babel building there. Yeah. You know, you've got all this yeah. money and just fly any place. Doesn't line up. Doesn't line up. No. You know, it's funny too. Let me say this as well, you know, and he's tied to a lot of wicked people. Uh, I definitely believe there's some serious connections between him and Reuben Israel. Um, you know, they were in a documentary together a couple of years ago called hate preachers of America. And if you look at Reuben Israel, he's flying all over the world preaching. How in the world do you have money to do that? You know, just like with Stephen Anderson. Yep. You know, no, I think they're covert Jesuits is what I think, or some kind of a uh, psyop or oh. something, some kind of agent. Yeah. Jesuits are a military order. So right. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah, I just think these two knuckleheads are just out there to to destroy Bible believing Christians. Yeah, and I see again why we have to oppose them because if we don't, then they are going to demonize us, and then the average person is going to think we're part of them, and then they'll pass laws to throw people like us in prison. You know. Yeah. And someone asked, uh, "Is there eternal security in the time of Jacob's trouble?" No. No, there is no eternal security in the time of Jacob's trouble. Except for the 144,000 sealed Jews. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Sorry to keep asking, but did Adam and Eve go to hell? No, I don't believe it. Nope. Um, Brian, if there was only one baptism, does that mean that the baptism in the Old Testament was of no effect because it was not of the Spirit, but then Jesus was baptized and the Spirit descended on him? There's a question uh, for you. There's there's more than one baptism. There's a lot of different yeah. baptisms. So... Yeah, there's more than one baptism, absolutely. Okay. And Mr. M77 uh, question, is it normal for a Christian to doubt their salvation? Sometimes I'm 100% and sometimes I'm not. Yeah, I mean, you know, it's, it's also part of spiritual warfare. You know, the uh, devil's trying to kind of influence you and get you to doubt your salvation. I mean, it happens. If you mess around and sin, you're really going to doubt your salvation. 
Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yep. Uh, thoughts on Kathy Burns, Dr. Kathy Burns. She wrote uh, Billy Graham and his friends and, um, uh, I don't, I don't remember some of the other stuff. Yeah, I see Jesus for life. KJB says Kathy Burns did not believe in eternal security. Yeah, that's right. Um, I wrote to her one time and uh, she wrote back and things and about a book I was trying to publish at the time. And, uh, you know, I don't know. I don't know if she's, I don't know what she says or believes or whatever right now. I know she wasn't a King James Bible believer early on. And then she started coming out and attacking the new versions. So it could be she's getting straightened out on things, but I I haven't had any contact with her for many years now. So I don't know. But she does put out some good information, you know, exposing Billy Graham's connections and things like that. So could we be here another 20 years? Uh, I don't think so. I just don't see how it can go much. I really don't see how it can go on much longer. I really don't. The way the body of Christ in, is right now and stuff like that, there's so many truly say people that are messed up and you know and the world's just getting worse and worse every day i don't see i can go on go on much longer from now where we're at yeah i would agree with that what do you think of jesse lee pearson i've never heard of him nope i don't know anything Uh, marriage and conception in Genesis chapter one. Well, let me say this about that. Well, they were the first human beings created. So uh, marriage was simple then. All they had to do was just come together. It was flesh joining flesh at that point. But later on, you know, it changed to where it had to be a commitment. Otherwise, it was fornication. Yep. Um, how would you show a charismatic, the apostolic sign gifts, uh, thing just went up nuts. Uh, I missed that. Basically, how would you show a charismatic that the sign gifts have gone away? Um, Mark chapter 16, uh, verse 17. And these signs shall follow them that believe in my name. Shall they cast out devils? They shall speak with new tongues. You know, and it goes on down through there. The signs are given in other words, early on and then you go to uh first corinthians you know, flip forward here chapter one um verse 22 the jews require a sign and the greeks seek after wisdom and so early on they're going to the jews the jews uh reject as a nation and so look through the book of first Corinthians and you see definitely a transition away from, you know, the sign gifts. So um, the Jews were given an opportunity in the early part of the book of Acts to, again, have a second chance to receive Jesus as their Messiah. And they were even given sign gifts to confirm the word and they rejected. And so the sign gifts went away. So to try and say that, you, and, and you know, the easiest way to do the whole sign gift thing is um, just simply say, okay, go lay your hands on, on the sick. We're going to go down to the hospital and lay your hands on sick people. And I want to see them recover. If you say you have the gift. Uh, oh, better yet. I mean, I, I had a charismatic nut attacking me uh, over my Facebook page yesterday and I, and they were so rabid against me. I was like, okay, well go to your nearest morgue and raise the dead and film it. I'll wait. Yep. <laughs> yeah, I mean, if you really look up what the charismatics actually believe, a lot of this stuff is witchcraft. It comes from voodoo. I'm getting ready to do a um, a whole series on the charismatics here coming up soon. And a lot of this tongue battling stuff, it's voodoo chanting. That's what it is. Mm -hmm. It comes from the occult. Yep. So... Yeah, I did a video years ago about I used I had this witches encyclopedia for a little while and it actually said right in the thing that, you know, the witches uh, speak in tongues. You know, it's it's devil spirit speaking through them. And by the way, uh, speaking in tongues in the book of Acts, every single time somebody spoke in tongues, there were Jews present, unbelieving Jews. Yep. 
So, and the gift of tongues that you see in First Corinthians chapter 12 through 14, that gift of tongues there, there's, you know, it says about unknown tongues and it's, there's supposed to be interpretation there. Um, it's talking about languages at that point in time. And I do believe in that gift of tongues, that there are certain Christians that are given the ability to really, you know, learn foreign languages, you know, and they, they have a really good ability with that for translating the Bible or whatever. So. Um, what is wrong with Gene Kim? Well, uh, for one, he teaches a false gospel. Number two, he uh, teaches that you can take the mark of the beast and still be saved in the time of Jacob's trouble. He also teaches the satanic trinity. So there's a lot wrong with Gene Kim. And that's just, you know, the, just a basic looking at what he does. I mean, he watched everything. I'm sure you'd find all kinds of stuff on him. Right. And, you know, and he's, he, he's obviously monetized. And and he's his video titles, it's all clickbait stuff, and it's just uh, it's a problem. Yeah. 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 He's not on the level of uh Robert Breaker and saying that salvation's you know, no prayer, but he's he pretty much teaches easy believism. It's pretty much what it is. His is more of the quick prayers, prayerism type. Yep. Uh, what's different from Gene Kim and Ruckman? Well, Ruckman, uh, I have a recording of him years ago saying that a lot of young men come out of his Bible school and talk about all the extra biblical kind of interesting, weird stuff that Ruckman mentioned. And they base their whole ministry on that. And, um, you know, and he said, you can't do that. You got to you got to just teach people the Bible and the Lord will promote you in his timing. And um, him and Robert Breaker don't do that. They they look to man to be promoted. Um, what if there's interpretation? I guess you're speaking, uh, talking about tongues. Well, tongues in the Bible are all languages. They were not um, gibberish. Blah, 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 blah. You know, like, like <laughs> the is back to you, okay? Like hashala, hantai, hantai, botai, whatever you want to call it. You know. <laughs> uh, Brian sent me this little video uh, last year of this snowman and. Whatever, it was pretty funny. <laughs> Frosty the demon. Yeah, Frosty the demon, that's it. Apostle, apostle. <laughs> With the gift of tongues and an NIV and two eyes that had no soul. <laughs> pretty good. Yeah. Yeah, it was pretty good. But um but yeah, basically tongues in the Bible are always languages. They're not some unknown gibberish or anything like that. If you read Acts chapter two, um you can see the languages listed out there. And then if you have unknown tongues and like I said, in first Corinthians 12 or 14, it's like, let's just say, for example, I come in and I start speaking it in Russian. Okay. Do I have the right to do that? No, because I don't have an interpreter. They can speak for me. See, that's what's going on there in first Corinthians 14. Yep. Uh, can you be saved using the modern versions? Um, you can understand enough about the gospel to get saved, but you're not going to continue using the new versions after you get saved. I'll yeah. say it that way. This is an honest question. Are the Arabs the descendants of Ishmael? Uh, yeah, for the most part. Yep. Um, what's your thoughts on flat Earth? I actually have a whole video called Geocentric Geocentricity Earth. You can go on my channel, check that out. I I go through the whole Bible, what it teaches about what the Earth is. So if you're interested in that, you can go to my channel and check that out. I'm not gonna get into it here because we'll be on a debate for probably about 30 minutes. Mm-hmm. Saw a question earlier too. I didn't get to finish this, um, but it was or answer this rather. Uh, what's the difference between testament and covenant? Um, well, testament obviously there's only two: Old Testament, New Testament. Covenant there were 
quite a few of those throughout the Bible, the Mosaic Covenant, the Abrahamic Covenant. You know, covenant is an agreement that God would make either with a man or a people and, you know, or descendants of people. And um, the new covenant, the covenant that God made with Abraham to bless his seed, um, that covenant basically, um, you know, it comes out as the new covenant in the new, you know, in the New Testament in the future. So, you know, it's, it's a big study. It's not one of them things that, you know, there's a lot of stuff about the Bible that you can't just answer in a minute. You know, you have to go through the scriptures. Mm -hmm. and, um, you know, one of the one of the signs of the end times is that the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. And people say, you know, give me an answer in five minutes or less. Well, I, I can't. You know, it, it takes a big study. It takes going through the scriptures and showing scripture after scripture after scripture. You know, yep. and it's so funny because, you know, these, you know, non-dispensationalists, like we saw earlier, they say about we just need to stick with the scriptures. And yet they used barely any scripture in the entire documentary. And they mm -hmm. say, you know, dispensationalism is such a confusing, it's so big and detailed. Well, it's it's big and detailed because there's so many scriptures that you can go over to prove the thing and you compare scripture with scripture. You know, uh, again, that's not going to be grievous to a, a saved, you know, born again Christian. You're going to love to hear the word of God. So... Yeah, absolutely. Have you heard the word prophet on YouTube? I was like, yeah, I have actually. His name is Clinton Ames. Um, he said Jesus Christ was a created being. He's a total wicked heretic. He's yep. a Pentecostal. Dresses in all black. Looks like a Catholic priest. Very weird. Can I do a video on the Lord's recovery? Huh? What is that? <laughs> That's weird. I don't know what that one is. Yeah, women <laughs> preachers are unscriptural. Joyce Meyer is lost. Absolutely. That woman is wicked. Yeah. Yeah. You need to be careful on YouTube. It's a, got, it's a woman that's got their own YouTube channel. Um, they're not of the Lord. I'm just going to warn you right now. I used to be, you know, a couple of years ago, I used to be okay with the idea of maybe a woman having a YouTube channel or whatever. I've kind of leaned the other way now. I just don't think women should have YouTube channels without the authority of a man. What do you think, Brian? Yeah, I agree with that. You know, yeah. Having a YouTube channel is one thing as far as just, you know, I know a lot of sisters here do, obviously, but making lots and lots of videos and studies in the scriptures and things. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, yeah. Uh. All right. This person is saying um, that that person is talking about the Lord's recovery uh, says, brothers, can I please get an answer to this? I'm part of the Lord's recovery. They have their own version. What are your thoughts on Witness Liam and Watman Nee? Or kind of odd names, but if they have their own version, run away. I mean, run as fast as you can. <laughs> like, yeah, like like Ray Comfort, he has his own version. Yeah. Yeah. I think even John MacArthur does too, doesn't he? Well, he has his own study Bible. I don't know if he ever wrote his own version, but he wow. basically just questions the text all the time and shows how smart he is by going to the Nestle's text. Yeah. Um, here we go. Here's a good question. Why do you think the Lord doesn't strike down those who mock his name or blaspheme him like those wicked celebrities? Well, I think the reason for that is because we are so close to the rapture that the Lord's patiently waiting. Their time's coming, you know. So. Yeah, I would agree with that totally. Because, I mean, you look at the time of Jacob's trouble and it's just it's horror the whole way through it. You know, this, yeah, it's terrible. This teaching that the first three and a half years is peaceful. Absolutely nonsense. <laughs> There's no scripture for that. You know, by peace, he'll destroy many. You know, the Antichrist comes in and says, we need peace. And the way you the way you get peace is to go out and slaughter people. Yeah. You know, peace through superior firepower. You know. 
who is the new Husky 394 XP? <laughs> That's me. Hi. How you doing? <laughs> if you don't know the story, okay, let me. I used to be called Rod of Iron KJV. And uh, I found out there's this cult in China or Jap Japan or something like that that has a, they're like a real military cult or something like that. Mm -hmm. And uh, they're called Rod of Iron Ministries. And uh, I had a couple of people actually write to me and ask me if I was associated with them. And I said, no, I'm not. And so I got to the point where I was like, Brian changed his name to KJVM. And so he's like, you should just change it to my old name just to be funny. And so the name just kind of stuck. So that was a that was a whole story with that. Yeah, we just asked, go ahead. I was just gonna say we just wanted to see how many of the the crazies we could trigger with that. And they said it, some kind of conspiracy. They're they're telling me to cough follower, Brian. <laughs> it was line in sinker. <laughs> yeah, it did work. People ask me why I don't use my name or whatever. I just don't. I don't like using my whole my full name on YouTube. I just don't. I don't want my wicked family to find my channel. Yeah. Uh, um, James X Catholics recently stated that Christians that deny the Trinity are, Trinity are devil possessed. False. Um, yeah, James is. Uh, I don't know what the the deal is with him. Um, I'm not going to recommend his ministry. I'm not going to waste my time with him. And uh, he's acting a lot more like a current Catholic for the Antichrist than he is an ex-Catholic for Christ. Yep. So don't waste your time with James Patel. Why did Paul say do not forbid speaking in tongues? Well, he did. He was saying that because, you know, don't forbid speaking in other languages. Okay. Mm -hmm. Not not vain babbling. All right. Don't get tongues in the Bible confused with vain babblings and gibberish that the charismatic speak. Yep. Uh, have you heard of Steve Wilson? I have not. Have you? Nope. No. Uh, why does Anderson call you oneness? Um, because he doesn't understand the Bible. That's why. Um, the, the different positions are the Trinitarians believe that there are three separate people in heaven that call themselves one God. <laughs> yeah. How does that work? Um, Pentecostal oneness. Uh, they believe that Jesus is, when he's praying, he's praying, Jesus on earth is praying to Jesus in eternity. Um, and, you know, there's no distinction between Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Um, that's yeah. not what a Bible believer believes. There is distinction between the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. This is there's distinction between body, soul, and spirit that we have. Okay, a modalist teaches, again, very similar to the oneness Pentecostal, the modalist says that Jesus is there. He just can shape shift into different modes. So, you know, one minute he's Jesus, then he's the old man in heaven, the father, and then he's the flying bird. You know, um, no, that doesn't work either. You know, it's the distinction between them is body, soul, spirit. That's the distinction. They're not three separate beings, three separate persons, whatever you want to call it. That's heresy. And so, you know, they, they can't, there's no name. Understand something about Catholics when they deal with what they call heretics. They try to categorize everybody You know you talk to a Catholic you say, I'm not a Catholic. They say oh you're a Protestant And you say no, I'm not a Protestant. Oh, well, then you're a heretic You know, <laughs> they'll, they'll try to get you into some little category So if you don't believe in the Trinity, then you're a modalist you say no, I'm not a modalist Yes, you are. Okay, then you're a oneness. No, I'm not a oneness. I believe what the Bible teaches It just it goes haywire. It doesn't work for them. They have to try and categorize you somewhere. So. Anybody else in your family is saved or how do you deal with lost family members in terms of regular contact, seeing them regularly? Well, uh, my father is saved. Okay. And my father supports my ministry. So other than that, you know, I don't have any really contact with anybody else in my family. They can't stand to be around me. I'm unpleasant, according to them. 
So yep. I, mean, uh, they, I would go ahead. Go ahead, Tim. I was just going to say, yep, I'm in the, in the exact same boat. <laughs> right. And as far as contact goes, you know, I don't see them very often. Don't really care to. You know, there's really no point. You know, they, they reject the Bible. All right, Brian, your turn. Well, I don't know what you guys are talking about. I get along well with everybody. <laughs> <laughs> Self-denial, that works. <laughs> yeah. No, that's it's something that you'll, you know, at first it's kind of rough when you first get saved and you have family members and close friends turn against you. You know, it's it hurts a lot, but, you know, you'll get to the point where your love for the Lord Jesus Christ will supersede anything else. You'll just say, you know what? I don't care who turns against me. Um, I love the Lord. I know what he did for me. Yep. Is Edward PF one, two, three, a hyper dispensationalist? Um, I don't know what he is. You know, I don't I, either. he's against everything. I mean, he is, he is God in his mind, you know? So, uh, you know, I would say yes to that, but, you know, I'm sure he would redefine hyper dispensationalist to probably what we believe or something, or I, I have no idea. You know, he's just nuttier than a pecan pie. I mean, the guy's just. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, I never could figure out what he believes. You know, he, he made a he made a video about me not too long ago. said so he's confused about what I believe. Well, tell you the truth, I'm confused about what you believe. <laughs> Yep. <laughs> uh here's a good question is ephesians 4 4 through 7 talking about ephesians 3 2 dispensation of grace okay let's go there real quick um there is one body, one spirit, even as you're called in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all who is above all and in you all. But to every one of us is given grace according to the measure of the gift of Christ. Now, Ephesians 3 2. If you have heard the dispensation of the grace of God was given, given me to you, or yes, I was the same thing. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. What do you think? What do you think, Ryan? Yeah, absolutely. You know that's part of the mystery that Paul reveals in Galatians three twenty eight too that there's neither Jew nor Greek, there's neither bond nor free, there's neither male nor female. We're all one in Christ. Um, that's not true in any other dispensation. Yep. So yeah, one body. So. Oh yeah. That's a, that's one thing the hyper dispensationalists believe. They believe there's two separate bodies. I want to bring that point up. Yep. Absolutely. Um, uh, Brian, can you please pray for me? My whole family is Catholic, and my aunt, who has been Catholic for over 43 years now, 43 years now, has banned my Bible, her words, from entering family functions. Yeah, I'll pray for you. You know, there's there's that's a real common thing. I see that quite a bit, unfortunately, that, you know, Catholic relatives, especially just, oh boy, for people that are supposedly, you know, the, the one true church of Jesus Christ that, you know, founded on the apostle Peter, uh, they sure hate the Bible. <laughs> it's kind of weird. Yeah. <laughs> uh, do I still recommend the common man's reference Bible? Yeah. I mean, take it with a grain of salt. Um, again, a lot of these guys, they'll, they'll say stuff about the Trinity. And, you know, uh, yeah, I'm not going to openly condemn some guy until I talk to him. And, and, you know, do you really believe that there's three separate people in the whole thing? You know, um, you know, I'm, I'm not I don't, in, you know, use a study Bible as my main Bible. I just have my Cambridge Bible right here that, you know, it has no notes in it except for my own, you know, up in here just to. You know, remind myself what the text is about. I can kind of find it easier easier that way. Uh, 
Can you explain the virgin birth? I'm new on the study because didn't Mary have other children? Yes, she did. Mm -hmm. And basically the virgin birth is different than immaculate conception. I want to say that immaculate conception is the fact that Mary had Jesus Christ and she was sinless. Okay. Uh, the Bible does not teach that Mary was a sinner. Mm -hmm. Basically what happened was Jesus Christ was not procreated like most men, like all men is. Okay. Most men. All of man. All right. So the Holy Ghost came down to her and was put into her womb. And Jesus Christ came out in flesh. That's the way Jesus Christ could come on, come on the earth. So that's the best way I can explain it. Yep. And she did have other children, by the way, too. You're right yeah. on that. So she was not a perpetual virgin like the Catholic Church teaches. Right. And again, that's something we, we should do in the future at some point, you know, that debunk this nonsense teaching that the Catholics do get some things right. Uh, no, they don't. They don't get anything right. Right. Now, I've heard this one teaching one time that says that, uh, or this not a teaching, but this one guy said, uh, I was in my Mental Illness Mondays video, and this one guy said uh, that Catholics teach eternal hell. Um, Eternal hell is actually not scriptural. And uh, and what I mean by that is hell itself will go into the lake of fire. Eternal torment is scriptural. So yeah. no, they don't have that one right either. Does the Lord have a wife? I know that sounds silly, but just asking. Well, uh, Revelation chapter 19 talks about the bride, um, you know, being prepared you know, for the marriage and things. So um, technically the church is his, is his wife, you know? So it was a big study again, you know, can't get into all that stuff right now, but you know, we are likened to the bride of, you know, to a bride and we're one flesh with Jesus Christ. So. Well, I think we should probably start kind of wrapping things up here. Um, yeah. Getting kind of late. So, been on for over three hours now. Yep. Is the day of Christ and the day of the Lord the same thing? Uh, no, it's not. Uh, day of Christ would be in certain places called the rapture, it's a reference to the blessed hope. Um, except in Second Thessalonians chapter two, in context, the day of Christ there is the second coming. Uh, the day of the Lord is the second coming because the day of the Lord is a reference to the millennial kingdom. One uh, thousand years is one day to the Lord. So, and Jesus Christ is going to physically rule and reign for a thousand years. Yep. Um. One, I guess, here's a good question. Should Christians be involved in the pro-life movement? Uh, I don't think we should be involved in any kind of worldly nonsense, to tell you the truth. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I've heard of Christians yoking up with Catholics because there are Catholic pro-lifers out there. And they'll yeah. join together in rallies, you know. You know join together to fight the common evil or something. Pfft, wrong. All right, I guess this should be... Uh, the last question why are there so many groups in christianity well because this is the uh times we live in this is basically the falling away the apostasy so many cults today that are coming under the name of christianity taking you know the names of the bible and putting them on cults you know uh people don't want to hear what the bible says anymore it's more about tradition and their feelings mm -hmm. not only That's that why. not only that but they disobey uh uh, I think yeah, Second Timothy two fifteen, rightly dividing the word of truth. Yep. No. Well, yeah. I mean, yeah, they do that, and plus, you know, they just don't even care what the Bible says anymore. We we believe firmly what the Bible teaches and what the Bible says. You know, we don't go to traditions of anything like that. Yep. Yeah, there was actually a book I have it in my collection. It's uh, Noah Hutchings, and he wrote a book called Why So Many Churches, and. Uh, or why are there so many churches, something like that. And his contention was that because people don't rightly divide the word of truth, the, the non-dispensational thing 
is why there are so many different denominations. And I agree with that. Mm -hmm. You know, you see people and they cross lines and they take things from other dispensations and they say, this is for us today. And they start their whole sect as a result of that. Right. So, yeah. Dispen the non-dispensational thing is very, very serious. It and, really and, you know, I'm not going to, I'm not going to go after some new believer that says I've never heard of dispensationalism. I'm not going to say, well, then you're lost. Certainly. But when you get these people that hear dispensational truth, like these idiots in the, you know, documentary we watched tonight, they hear it, they know what the arguments are and uh, they reject it. Nope. They're not saved. It is an absolute vital doctrine. Um, you know, you, you can't be saved and be a non-dispensational, you know, believer. Just it isn't going to happen. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. So, and, you know, and I just say this too in closing, and that is the extreme danger of this movement. You say, why are they coming out with this a dispensation of heresy? What's, why is it so important to them to get this out there saying we got to destroy dispensationalism because if they do destroy dispensationalism, quote unquote, they can't. But if they if they can destroy it in some people's minds, then they're setting those people up to take the mark of the beast in the future. You know, the whole world is going to worship the beast. Where do you worship church buildings? Number one there. And Anderson said, you know, somebody asked him the question the one time they said, are you going to keep worshiping in your church building? When the tribulation starts and he said yes absolutely i'm not going to change a thing you know these guys are they're going to be preaching that you have to be part of a local new testament church in the time of jacob's trouble and then the mark of the beast will come out and they'll say it's not a problem if you take it because you're eternally secure you can't lose your salvation that is the reason for this attack on dispensationalism mm -hmm. yep absolutely so, So <laughs> that's a pretty good comment there. <laughs> if Anderson's church committed adultery, why didn't he kill that member? If he believes in killing someone who lusts after another woman. <laughs> yeah. Really? Yeah, now you, you see the hypocrisy of that cult. So. Yep. All right. Well, let's close it with that. And, um, you know, what more can we say? Yeah. <laughs> that was fun, you know, and, uh, you know, keep this thing going on for a long time. But um, fellowship that we have coming in heaven is going to be really sweet. I'm really looking forward to that. Uh, meeting all the Christians that have lived down through the centuries and hearing what they went through and what it was like, you know, and getting to talk to the Apostle Paul and John and Peter and, you know, and uh, all the brethren just over the centuries. Man, it's just going to be so neat. Mm -hmm. I'm looking forward to that. And you know, it's it's funny because you get to you get to be with brothers and sisters in Christ, and there's just a that that fellowship of the spirit is there. It's so strong. You just don't feel like stopping. You know. Yeah. Want to keep talking about the Bible and yeah? Did you see that? Oh, what about this? And, and it's just so neat. Yeah. That's what heaven is. Yeah. That's heaven. We aren't going to be heaven is not. Uh, good things on earth magnified in heaven in terms of, you know, if you like pizza on earth, then you have it forever in heaven or something. Yeah. That ain't going to be it. Heaven is about Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. you know? uh, it's a prepared place for a prepared people. Yeah. You know, and we're going to, we're going to get there and it's just going to be, Oh man, the fellowship is going to be great. You know, so what are we going to do for all of eternity? I know exactly what we're going to do for all of eternity. <laughs> You know, we're just going to be talking about the Lord and, you know, worshiping him and praising him. And man, I can't wait. I'm sure Amen. we're all going to tell our stories. Don't you think? Yeah. Yeah. I'm going to just have these big. I, what's that? I was just saying, I'm looking forward to talking to William Tyndale. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I actually had a brother tell me guy I used to know graduate of PBI from way back in the old, old days of PBI. But, and he told me, he said the one time he said, he said, I know this might sound really carnal, but he said, I hope that there's a, like on star Trek, they had that hollow deck, you know, star Trek, the next generation, they had the holograph uh, deck or whatever you go there and say a time period, and you go back to it. 
And he said, I hope that there's something like that in heaven that we could, you know, kind of go back to certain periods in church history and actually sit there in the audience and listen to, you know, D.L. Moody's, you know, preaching or go back to the first century and relive it and whatever. Yeah. <laughs> Not that yeah. it's on that, but, you know, I know what he meant. Yeah. Yeah. Like, yeah. like, you know, basically play it like a movie on a screen or something, you know, up there. Like, yeah, but, but you'd like actually be in it. You know, oh, like, okay. walk like around stuff. So oh, okay, you know, the Lord can do anything. We don't even know. You know, Jesus even said, "There's so many things I have to tell you, but you can't bear them." Yeah. You know? So it makes me wonder what we have in store for us. Well, gonna be great. So, okay, um, guess we'll close out here. And I hope everybody has a good night or morning or whatever it is where you're at. <laughs> uh, I guess we'll see you all in the next video or videos or whatever. Yep. Yeah. Good night to everybody. Yeah. Good night, brother.